What up, Sifted crew? It's Game Face, episode 355 on Sifted Games at Sifted.net. I'm Shane Satterfield, your humble host of Game Face and the founder of Sifted. And alongside me today to celebrate Gamescom, it's Matt Kyle. What's up, Matt? You look really excited about, no. about celebrating Gamescom. Thrilled. <laughs> uh gamescom opening night live either just ended or is about to end jeff Keighley's big press event to kick off gamescom every he year said mortal Kombat. there can't be that much left yeah um he had kind of put out some statements over the last week trying to keep people from getting too excited over what was about to happen he does that a lot he does seem to do that a lot anymore um i do you think that that's because he doesn't believe in the shows he's doing or do you think it's because he believes that people get way too excited for this stuff and need something to kind of bring them back to earth oh a bit of both yeah (laughs) it probably is a little bit of both actually um so look we totally get it probably the early audience for the show today is going to be a little low because you guys are watching the end of it and hopefully keely did something for a big finale there fingers crossed um so I, I had to stop watching come upstairs when they were showing ava uh, the city building game yeah he um he's not well, alan wake 2 was the last thing vincent says. Oh, okay that, that tracks he's not too picky with what goes into his shows no i mean they showed a Zack snyder trailer so yeah anything goes at this point yeah anything i think that can bring in some revenue it, yeah it appears well, i don't know if that's gonna do that but. you don't think they paid for that to appear in the show netflix yeah. No. 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 Netflix. Do you, do you think he did it on his own accord? I think. Yeah. Well, because it was attached to an announcement that a Rebel Moon game is theoretically going to happen one day. Mm-hmm. So whatever. Yeah. Um, it was a scramble this morning, getting ready for this show and kind of keeping an eye on what was going on in Jeff Keighley's event. Um, but I went and looked in our admin, which you know we use to curate for the site, and we can see a good like log of everything, and there wasn't a whole lot. Like, I kind of, after I got things set up here and ready to do our show, I started actually curating and going in and looking at the stuff. And really, there's like eight or nine trailers that are like Mm -hmm. really important, like ones that I got up right away. And they're up on the site right now if you want to check them out. Um, So not a huge show by Keeley standards, but he's in a tough position with Gamescom. It's sandwiched right in between his Summer Game Fest and the Game Awards and... Having to do three shows like that in like a six month period, that's pretty tough. Um, That's a big ask of the games industry, really. Um, It didn't appear that there were hardly any big debuts in the thing today. No, I mean, they shadow dropped Fort Solis, which is funny. (laughs) Um, Talk about not knowing what else to do with something. Yeah. Like, it feels like you put that out and like, that thing was going to get buried no matter what in the schedule for the rest of this year. Mm -hmm. So I guess go ahead and you know that's sort of i mean otherwise would we even be talking about it probably right. not so yeah um gamescom proper the actual show kicks off tomorrow and as always at sifted.net we will have the best coverage anywhere on the internet i know most of you listening to this will still go on twitter and waste your time looking at a bunch of crap you don't care about i'm just telling you go to sifted.net this week if you want to save your time checking out all the important stuff from gamescom or you can be stupid and waste your time on youtube or on twitter it's your choice um how do you think gamescom is gonna when it's all said and done how it's gonna shape up uh yeah i don't i'll be honest, i don't care <laughs> is it gonna be like the uh the hurricane that wasn't this week in los angeles I somewhat i don't know it, <laughs> none of it matters because the whole fucking industry is just holding its breath for armored core 6 and starfield so yeah yeah if you're wondering armored core 6 we do not have code for that yet um i think honestly from software and bandai Namco is making a mistake because if you remember what they did with elden ring was they sent it out way early and they sent it to everybody yeah like they sent code for Elden Ring to publications that normally never get review code. They were just like, you know what? We're going to carpet bomb the industry with this game and look at what it did. Mm-hmm. You would think they would have learned from that and been like, you know what? We're just going to do that with every game from now on. But no. I think they have a different attitude towards Armored Core because it's such a different thing. Yeah. Like, Armored, I mean, it's a, it, there's hype around it because it's from. Mm-hmm. But Armored Core has a 
I think Armored Core has a hard cap on its audience. Yeah, like, I mean, it it's never it going to sell as well as Elden no, Ring. It, it's never going to be universal the way Elden Ring became. Yeah. I just figured you might as well give it a chance. <laughs> yeah. Because we had an Elden Ring review code like two weeks early. Yeah, but also who knows how hot this thing's coming in. Yeah. Yeah, so there's some things to keep in mind when you think about Armored Core 6. The fact that we haven't got review code, there's no reviews out there yet. Um, just something to keep in mind. In fact, we're going to talk about a game today on the show that there still really are no reviews for. Mm-hmm. And it's a big game that comes out every year. And for whatever reason, this year, there was no early review code and no reviews before the game launched. Um, so and usually when that happens, not always, but usually when that happens, it's for a reason. So we'll talk about that a little later on in the show. But but yeah, how about this week, Matt, where we were scared into believing that like, L.A. was going to become like Noah's Ark flooded. And and it turns literally, I don't know about you, but on the west side, it rained lightly for from like four in the afternoon until like three in the morning. And that was it. No, no, it rained, there was here, no it rained wind. here for like 15 hours. Oh, it did. It, it, it was no wind. It was um, not much wind. It was fine. Uh, there's been a lot of flooding in Hollywood just because of the drainage right. that in LA. I mean, yeah. I mean, you see, like, all, I mean, if you see the the footage of like, you know, drainage problem, you know, like, you know, Fountain in Ogden had a sinkhole and like it flooded up near like Universal Mud Studios slides and, and stuff. stuff like that. And it's like, yeah, that happens every time it rains in LA yeah. because LA's rain, drainage is terrible. Um, it rained but again, harder it was, this it, winter on but, its own without yeah, a hurricane. Couple of the, couple of the winter storm. <laughs> well, it wasn't a hurricane. It was barely a tropical storm by the time it got to us. It did yeah. real damage in Baja California, mm-hmm. and it did real damage up in the mountains where it didn't slow down. Inland, as much. it did damage. Um, there was flooding. But it was and... never really going to be a thing here. It was just you know, Californians don't do well when we have <laughs> warning of something. Right. You know, we're much better at earthquake. The earthquake was like, well, whatever. You know, well, the crazy earthquake. part was, it was like during it. And it it had like, just started raining, and we didn't know at that point how bad it was going to be. We were still like man, we could still get hammered by this hurricane. And then an earthquake happens. <laughs> it's like, I can now say I am one of the few people who survived a hurricane and a, a quake at the same time. What were they calling it? Like a quake, not quake NATO. Hurricane. Hurricane. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it was, a, it was a tropical storm by the time it got to us and not much of one. Yeah. But the next one will be better or worse. I promise. It won't be the last time that happens. Yeah. So... Um, so anyway, no Armor Core 6 in the show today. However, it should be in the show next week, along with, um, what else are we going to have in the show next week? We still know Starfield, by the way. I am playing Starfield. Um, I've already played it for five or six days at this point. Fuck you. I know. It sucks. I, I don't mean, I don't say that to gloat or anything. Um, I'm just explaining to you when we're going to be able to do coverage of the game. Um, so... No, not even in next week's show. It's the 31st is the embargo for everything Starfield. And I just want to let you guys know, our patrons know, that we're going to have a big blowout for you guys at Starfield on the 31st at embargo. Because we got the code so early, we have time to do big stuff with the game. Um, And I think you guys are going to be very happy with the stuff that we do for Starfield. Um, But it won't be in next week's show. And then, actually, we have... Immortals of Avium will be... Immortals from Avium will be in next week's show as well. Um, And then I do have one one note. You know Um, you're in trouble when the fucking company logos don't run run well yeah 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 exactly <laughs> i started it up last night and i'm like oh no yeah <laughs> oh no um i do have one note so as usual i will be out of town for labor day weekend every year i go home for labor day weekend to spend a little bit of time with my mom um and so the the show that will be after labor day the tuesday after labor day literally the day after labor day there's no show so Labor Day week after Labor Day, we don't have a show. And then I actually get back into Los Angeles the following Monday. And we're going to try and do that show on Tuesday because we have a feeling it's probably there'll probably be enough on Starfield for us to just to do a show. Um, so my problem with doing shows coming back is like, oh, do I have time to play games? Well, I will have played Starfield at that point for dozens and dozens of hours. And probably that episode is going to be 90% Starfield. Um, so anyway, just keep in mind, we have no show the week of Labor Day and then the week after Labor Day, it will probably be Tuesday, but it might be Wednesday. And as always, we'll communicate all this stuff on Twitter or X or whatever the hell it's called at this point. So you guys know what's going on. Or if you're a regular on the site, you guys will just know what's going on because I'm always communicating with you guys on the site. So uh, just some notes. Um, and I know it's not ideal because Zelda, the same thing happened. Mm-hmm. Like, I, we weren't around for when Zelda launched, and now kind of the same thing's happening with Starfield, but not really. I mean, well, ultimately... The recovery period will be shorter with this one, yeah. I think. <laughs> I hope so. 
<laughs> I hope so. Um, and don't try to get any information out of me about Starfield. It's not going to happen. Although I heard today that like 40 minutes of it leaked or something. A bunch of it's been leaking the whole time because clearly they gave it to the right people who weren't going to do them wrong and not me. Yeah. Matt's a little upset that he hasn't got I'm furious yeah. is what I am. Okay? <laughs> I tried, this, too. You get the, I, everyone I know tried. But yeah. they are, But yeah, apparently if you're not uh, uh, some influencer child, you don't get a code. Well, I replied back to them after they only sent me one code. And I was like, hey, what about Matt or whatever? And they just never replied. Mm-hmm. I never got a reply from them about it. So um, I am playing it. And again, we will have a bunch of coverage of the game when its embargo breaks on August 31st. We got you guys covered. There won't be an episode of Game Face right away. You'll have to wait a few days till the following Tuesday until Matt and I talk about it together. Um, but we will have a bunch of coverage of the game on embargo break, which is something we don't get the opportunity to do all that often. And I'm pretty excited about. So um, let's see what else we got here. I think that's it for the intro. Maybe time to get into housekeeping. Uh, the first topic for housekeeping was Gamescom opening night live, which just finished, and the fact that the show is tomorrow. I'll be honest, Matt, I don't expect a ton of amazing stuff coming out of Gamescom. Like I wouldn't I, think so. I One, there just aren't that many games being released anymore. Like that's, Well, there are, but like we know about all of them. Like, there's, yeah. nothing to, there's, no, that's, there's nothing to announce yet because all the stuff that's been backed up for two years is finally coming out this yeah. year. It's just you got to clear the deck yeah. like, at this point. There's just nothing. You can't start hyping. And no one wants to start hyping new shit because they've got existing shit to release in the next three months. So yeah. It's it's one of the least like surprise-filled shows I think we'll ever see because everyone's got to get the stuff they have you know were supposed to release last year out. Gamescom always gets slighted, let's yeah. be honest. It's just the timing of it. It just, especially, maybe now that things have changed with E3, it might improve over the next few years. I doubt it. But I doubt it. You, yeah. w- you want to get that stuff out in the midpoint of the year. You want to put that out near the end of Q2. Like, you don't want to wait until now to start talking about stuff you're hyping yeah. in the fall. The industry is used to a Gamescom's cadence. a good place to, to do that. Or, and so is TGS. Like, a good place to, like, introduce that hands-on to the public if you're ready for it. Mm-hmm. But, like... In terms of, like, industry announcement, that's always going to be June in some yep. form. The industry is just used to a It's cadence. just where it is. Yeah. yeah. It just knows at certain points. It Look needs at how to... long it took them to stop releasing things on Wednesday, even long after right. the retail pipeline <laughs> stopped in demanding you had to release things on Wednesday. Yeah. You know? Yeah, it took a long time. Yep. Um, so anyway, Gamescom is happening all week long. As I said earlier, we'll have tons of coverage of everything on Sifted. It'll save you a ton of time. Don't use Twitter. Don't use YouTube. Use Sifted.net. Got a Gambler's 33S is the embargo. Is there when a new game releases or is that a recent thing? Embargoes on game reviews and stuff has been around for as long as I've been doing this yeah. for 20 some years. Yeah, longer. every game has one. They People. send you a review code, and they tell you the exact day and time mm-hmm. that you can publish your coverage of the game. Some of my earliest memories of game re- game coverage on the internet talked about embargoes. Yeah. It wasn't really an issue with print magazines because they were a month. Their lead they're, they're, times. Yeah, yeah, their lead times were a month, basically, so yeah. you always knew when you were. In a, but that was also why you would end up with reviews of games that were out a month and a half earlier, in, you know, a month and a half later like Mm -hmm. there were no i i I blew a young a young person's mind recently by noting that like nobody knows when super mario brothers one came out there is no release date known for that game there's a lot of old games no one cared the first real release date was sonic 2 sonic tuesday that was the first time anyone had really publicized a game coming out on a specific day and then mortal monday did that afterwards for mortal Kombat. and then like what day a game came out became more important before sonic 2 no one had ever kn- things just showed up yeah. in the store it's like running sifted because we've launched the site so late in the game and we have to go back and we have to constantly add old games and matt any game that launched in like the 90s it's like 50 50 where we actually have a release date. Usually you'll be you'll be lucky to get a month. And then if mm-hmm. I have the month, I just choose the fifteenth. And, <laughs> yeah. and a bunch of the a bunch of like release dates for those games are known because people had re- some there's you know, people who just take took the receipt for a game yeah. and would stick it in the case yeah. and they open like I know I bought this the day it come out came out, the day oh, the there it is. is this. So that's the game the game day the game came out. Yeah. That's how we know release dates of some things. Things have changed for sure. I mean the industry is so much bigger now and there's so oh, much yeah. more excitement around well, it. Well also there, there was no reliable way to get you know, no one you know, I remember going over and asking when Zelda was coming Ocarina of Time was coming in and nobody there are, it should be this Wednesday, but it might be the day after because yeah. you don't. Uh, the retail pipeline doesn't prioritize video games, so <laughs> yep. it was a whole different world. The times have changed for sure. So anyway, um, Gamescom is this week. Keep your browser pointed to sifted.net for all the latest. Uh, next up, Starfield, obviously, big story. Probably the big, even 
with Baldur's Gate 3 out there, it already feels like the lexicon has shifted towards mm-hmm. Starfield at this point. Everybody's talking about it, pining for it, or upset that they don't have the hardware that they need to play it. Like, it's kind of the big discussion right now. Um, and so, as you said, some stuff is leaking out. People, You're not supposed to publish anything about the game if you're playing it under embargo. But some stuff has leaked out. And one of the things that leaked out was the start screen. Right. For Starfield. And somebody who used to work on Diablo 2 many, many years ago mm-hmm. went on Twitter and... A known idiot, by the way. Right. Who is, he, this is not his first stupid His comment. first rodeo, yeah. yeah. He's He's been known in the industry to say stupid things in the past. Well, he's lived up to his reputation this mm-hmm. week by saying that the start screen shows that uh, Starfield is a rushed game that is not finished. Yeah, the and- start screen, it looks exactly like every other title screen Bethesda's ever done. Yeah. <laughs> and, of course, uh, my favorite counter to that was just like, have you, have you seen Elden Ring's title screen? Have you seen every Souls game's title screen? Yeah. Did those not get made with care? Yeah. Did those get rushed? You idiot. What an idiot. Unbelievable. <laughs> I mean, he's just looking for for engagement because no one cares about him. And anymore. it worked. It did I work. mean, let's be honest. It's, I mean, Even I've... Pete Hines, you know, like put in a rebuttal. So Yeah. It was just like ridiculous. And you know, although Pete did note, it's like, yeah, the title screen is one of the first things we finished because we it's knew what it was going to be. It was like, <laughs> it, it, we... We put the effort into the game, not the title screen. Like the title yeah. screen just to get you there. I mean, have you ever seen St- Skyrim's title screen? Yeah. Well, I mean, there's lots of games with very Spartan title screens. Most games are that way. They're not elaborate. Yeah. Like, what is this guy even talking about? Why are we even talking about it? It bothers know. me that have we're you talking seen, about Have you seen it. Diablo 2's title screen? It's nothing. It's yeah. nothing. And the weird part about this guy is, like, a lot of times you say, oh, a publication might publish an editorial that says something like that. And a lot of times it's clickbait. They're trying to yeah. get people to go to the website. Some people will you know bomb a game give it a really low review score to get people to their site or whatever but this guy doesn't have a reason for clickbait he just it's like he's just thirsty for relevance basically and i am glad by the way that we have not mentioned his name at least during this entire discussion i don't remember his name yeah um so anyway right now you know starfield is such a big topic that almost anything about it stirs up people and gets people excited gets Mm -hmm. people talking about it well that's also like the engagement trick now because like if you're signed up for the stupid twitter subscription thing you theoretically elon can make money if he decides to send you the check which he hasn't for some people including some of his like biggest weirdo fanboys (laughs) which has caused them to turn against him now it's (laughs) you could have just admitted he was a douche all along and just (laughs) completely avoided the middle part it wasn't that difficult to see (laughs) yeah here we are yep so anyway um yeah starfield still a week and a half away for most people and i have a feeling there'll probably be another there'll be another story or two like this along the way because um, people are just so excited for it that mm. anything about it generates I'm waiting for someone to just and... outright break the embargo. Just mm-hmm. you know, be like, here's all the stuff. Well, yeah. I mean, there's 40 minutes of gameplay that went Right, but I'm waiting for somebody who's like... All of pro- it. You know, more like some blue check weirdo is just going to be like, I'm just going to do it because freedom of speech. Right, or something, <laughs> or something like, like that, yeah. It's, it's some <laughs> stupid thing. I, you know that's coming. It might... Yeah. I Some mean, idiot's going to think that, that, that the payoff of, of engagement's going to be worth being blacklisted from industry PR forever. I mean, I do. I did think about this yesterday when this story was kind of like making the rounds. It's like, you know, I was thinking about Bethesda PR and how many codes they had to send out to influencers. And I was like, you know, I've worked with Bethesda for like 20 years. Like, they know me. Like, we've hung out. We've done things outside of the industry together. Like... They know they can trust me. I've worked at four different publications. I've never broken embargo at any of them. So they know if they send me a code, the stuff isn't going to end up on the internet. But they're sending that code out to like a thousand people or whatever. There's no way. Yahoo. They, there's no way they can there's, vet all those people. I can't count how many times I've been looking at Twitter or various things this week and be like, you got a code? Because really? Matt, all that matters is that I bet you if you go to their YouTube channel, they have 500,000 yeah. followers or whatever. And there's a bunch of little kids that sit there every day watching them babble or whatever. Mm-hmm. And it's risky now. Like you have to work with these people if you're a big publisher because obviously they have huge reach. But it's scary because you don't trust them. And there's nobody there. They have no supervisor there telling them like, don't do it. Don't do it. I'll fire you if mm-hmm. you do it. Like there's no fear there. They're like, 
nobody's gonna fire me i'll just wake up tomorrow and make another rant video on my youtube mm -hmm. channel and, and they've got like all these viewers and chat people this way it's like what well, you're us right this. Tell you should have broken embargo or no they'll be like tell us this tell us this and like oh, oh yeah. i can't let them down or they'll unsubscribe right and, you know, yeah the, there's the all pressures there it's way messier now than it used oh, yeah. to be so it would be terrifying to be a publisher in 2023 like you really have no control over what happens with this stuff as yeah. we saw today i mean at the least league. luckily the game is is procedural enough that like it's you can't really ruin it yeah you know like it's very hard to spoil anything in this game because of how individual the generation is for everybody's universe and how like oh no i i know something about the opening scene yeah in a 300 hour game right. you know, it's like yeah it's like who i mean it's like it's like okay i know the equivalent of the fact that you wake up in a cart in skyrim right like, who cares like, yeah like, that's not the point no yeah you know? i gotta be very careful <laughs> even facial expressions could tip my hand about this game so anyway um again big plan for starfield coming up keep your browser tuned to sifted.net next up a little bit of sad news this week matt in that the xbox 360 is finally being sent out to pasture every once in a while i'm like that's still here it okay. is kind of crazy they've supported it this long but sometime next year the xbox 360 store will shut down all the servers for 360 online games will start shutting down 360 was a great console matt yeah i still feel like it it probably is top three consoles of all time it's way up there yeah i played it more than anything other than maybe the super nintendo yeah i i mean Genesis. i have a gigantic library for that game because yeah. that literally that generation it was all xbox 360 for me my ps3 library is just all exclusives yeah and then my 360 is just huge mm -hmm. it was a great great console it's sad to see it go yeah, also I, we got news today that they're finally going to quit manufacturing the connect next month they're wow. still manufacturing connect cameras who's, who's getting that <laughs> i don't know is it just for parts <laughs> i don't know but I, I do have to hand it to microsoft like it does support its stuff way longer than really it needs to mm. um but yeah, so the Xbox, Xbox 360 next year will be its death knell, and it won't make it like a full 20 years. Although, who expects like a full 20 years from a console? Like, you're lucky you get five, frankly. I mean, you're lucky. You should feel lucky if you get seven. Mm -hmm. um, so to almost get two decades from Xbox 360 is pretty amazing. But it will be sad to see it go. It was a great era for games. It was, it was great because yeah. I mean, it's really just. It's just the store. I mean, yeah. You know, it's, and like, if you don't already have whatever you want on the 360 store, where are you been? Well, you still got time too to go yeah. snag any stuff that you do want. And anytime these stores close, though, there is the danger of like, I think somebody went and looked at the 360 library and said, okay, if they closed it today, there were like 300 and some games that would be lost. Mm -hmm. Like games that as of right now, there's no other storefront that has them. And therefore, you know, when you start thinking about preserving the history of the games industry, it's another console going out the pasture where people haven't really prepared for it, and we may lose some of those games. Yeah. So, I mean, if you have them, you can still download them. They're not going. They're not going anywhere. But like, you can't. We just can't buy them again. Well, if the store is closing, you wouldn't be able to download them. Yeah. Again. Well, that's a separate thing. Oh, you think so? 100%. So you'd still be able to download it like on your Series X or your Xbox. Well, One the backwards compatibility stuff is all going to still be supported fully. Right. Yeah. Uh, this is just for stuff that's not has not been brought forward on bc but that's, it's purely just being able to purchase them that's yeah. all that's going away you're yeah. gonna still be able to download them online will even still work with some stuff yeah um it's just you won't the store is closing so and you can't like, buy stuff anymore yeah, you're not gonna be able to buy kingdom for keflings anymore. can you re-download stuff still? absolutely are of you sure 100 yeah, percent sure yeah 100 okay. percent. not no doubt whatsoever okay it's just that's, the, that's it's encouraging just the then. store it's like, so if you want to do that thing like that guy did where he bought every single thing on the Wii U shop before it closed, you can. Yeah. <laughs> and you don't have to worry about hard drive space. You can, you can reinstall and delete as you need. What's your fondest memory of Xbox 360, Matt? Do you have one? Oh, not really. What um, about the crazy launch thing that we went to out in the desert? I don't want to call that fond. <laughs> um, yeah, we did I mean, like live nice. TV coverage of the Xbox 360 launch at G4, mm -hmm. and that was pretty amazing. Out in the middle of nowhere in this huge oh, warehouse, in the middle of Palmdale. And they the the crazy thing about it was is that 
the truck showed up with all the consoles in the back of it because everybody who attended there was going to get a console on launch day because that was a big deal. It was they hard were there to find for them. Thirty-six hours. It was just it was yeah. like a big camp. It was terrible. It was like a rave almost that yeah. lasted for like. It was days. a rave that everybody fell asleep at yeah. twenty-four hours in. And I remember the head of the network yelling at us like, "Get people up! Get people excited!" Yeah. And we're like, "These people have been up for twenty-seven hours. Yeah. What do you think they're? Like, what are you doing?" Yeah, because as producers, we need to get the crowd in behind the shots excited and like. And that was not happening. No, they're just like f you. They're dying. And so they've, and they, it was going to be like three hours so they can even buy the console. Well, a lot was, of them were only there to get the console because yeah. it was hard to find them. I was only there to get the yeah, console. Yeah, a lot of us were. And like, then the truck rolls in and they open the door and they, literally like a hundred consoles fall like onto the fall out concrete. Like, like, not that one. <laughs> <laughs> to his credit, I did. So we were first in line for that, though. Like, yeah. They let us buy all ours beforehand, yeah. and and to be fair, that that system I got that uh, lasted years, long yeah. past the usual Red Ring and Death. Yeah, it did last past the typical Red Ring lifespan for me. Ninja Gaiden Two killed it. Is that online. what killed it for you? I was halfway through Ninja Gaiden Two, and it just, <laughs> it just broke. And I'm like, well. And by that time, the Slim was out, and it was, like, yeah. it, was like, it was like, okay, I'll just get the new one and replace it. Yeah, for me with the 360, it was really just like an accumulation effect. Yeah. It was just like a piling on. My of- main thing with, with 360, I guess, memory is like that was the most online gaming I did. I had like, yeah. a, I had like a group online, and that was when like we were, we were there almost every night playing whatever the latest thing was to get all the achievements and do all that stuff. Yeah. And that was fun. That's but- when Xbox Live really hit a stride. Yeah, it was cool on Xbox, but on Xbox 360, that's when it really exploded. I guess my other memory would be getting my uh, that was the period where I got my plasma, Mm. um, and I played the I I broke it in for like a week. You do the thing, and then I played Alien. Well, not Alien. It was a Earth Defense Force Insect Armageddon. I think it was, Mm -hmm. and the whole HUD burned in after like (laughs) an hour. And I like, and I I called Best Buy the next day, and they're like, and they're like, that shouldn't be happening. That's a bad panel. We'll give it you know. So they oh, replaced good. it. Thank and God. The, the new one didn't do that. The new one is still downstairs. Uh-huh. After that. But like, no, I I oh, I have a slight edge against Insect <laughs> Armageddon. Because I don't of that. blame you. Because those TVs were like three grand. Yeah. When they came out, they were like the top of the line. I bought one too back then. It was like thirty two hundred bucks or whatever. Mm-hmm. But I never did get burn in, and yeah. I had it there's, for years. There's a little bit here and there. If you if you look like with like a flashlight on mine, you can see like four thousand HUDs slightly, oh, really? <laughs> slightly wow. in there here and there. Interesting. But not enough that you'd see it when you're like watching it. Yeah. Yeah. Like they, they were very sensitive, which is one of the reasons they were good. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just. You really should only be have been using that for watching movies. Pretty much, was, yeah. And even then, you could get like if you watch too much sixteen by nine, or you could get uh, or, the bars get burned in. You yeah. watch or too much cinema scope twenty or twenty. Oh, you could get the bars burned in. Yeah. Yep. Um, so anyway, rest in peace to the Xbox three hundred and sixty. You were a good friend, honestly. Um, Schneeky says my three hundred and sixty memory is the first time I ever played online with people. Tony Hawk eight, my mind was blown. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's when Xbox Live like. Before that, you could play so online with people, yeah, but then the interface they bumped yeah, the it all. The interface worked. The group chat worked. Like it was, yeah. it was that was the easy. That was, that was the lowest the barrier to getting online ever was. Even and now, I don't think it's as good. I yeah. really do. like. There's a whole thing. It's like where's the where's the the, the <laughs> Look at login? Lisa. Like no one can get in the separate rooms. Like it's it doesn't stick. Hello. <laughs> She's like, give me some attention. <laughs> Yeah, so um, I, I would say Xbox 360, my top three or four consoles yeah, of all time. There. That's a tough list to crack for me, man. Um, it was great. Um, I really enjoyed it. And a lot of people will point out, oh, by the end, the PlayStation 3 outsold it and blah, 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 which may be true. But I played my PlayStation 3 like one fiftieth of the amount of time I played my Xbox 360. Yeah, and only the PS3 only came out for exclu- exclusives. exclusives. Yep. It was a Nintendo console. Yeah, and honestly, my PS3 was the first console that I ever experienced analog stick drift with. I was mm. playing a some Jack and Daxter game and I put the controller down on the coffee table and I went to the got a drink and I came back and the character was walking across the screen like mm. a ghost was playing. I looked down and I was like, what's going on? I don't think <laughs> Destiny was PS4, right? Ooh. That was that gen? I think so, yeah. Because like that was the first I ran into it. Because I remember like it was a night where I was I was playing. And my friends were like, "You're off tonight. Like, you're not. Yeah. You're not, you're sucking tonight. Like we're not. You're not help getting through all this stuff with us, right?" And I went at one point. I went to the to the menu screen and I couldn't select what I wanted. And I let it go. And the the cursor just wandered off yeah. to the right. And I'm like, <laughs> "What?" And I couldn't. And I'm like, oh, and so I had to go get a new a new uh, controller. I was yeah. the first stick drift thing I yeah ran into. when you see it for the first time you're like it's a ghost playing my game <laughs> it's funny but yeah all my stick drift problems have been uh playstation controllers 
Sneaky says the current Xbox Dash is appalling, just abysmal to use. I agree a million percent. The, the new one is terrible. It sucks. All of them have sucked. Like, like why, every why Dash. Why move the things where you, like, how come my, the My Games and Things is a tiny little thing up at the top now? Like, I don't know. Why, what's that? I, what was the purpose of moving all it, that? It hasn't been good since Xbox 360 Blades. No. Just go back to it. Everybody loved it. It worked perfectly. Everyone understood it. I don't know why they ever went away from it. Um, Eric Cartmenis says, I'm still making memories with my 360. That's great, man. I watched um, a video a few days ago about some guy. <laughs> His whole shtick is he just goes and tries to find old Xbox 360s and fixes them and sells them. And mm. makes like $60 a pop or whatever on them. And it, that was a walk down memory lane because he went, he goes through like all the different versions that there have been, like the Zephyr version and like that I had forgotten about because it's been so long. Um, and he would go in and look at people's profiles and see like, when's the last time somebody played this console? Mm. He went to like um, Goodwill and got like a box of like 500 Xbox 360s from Goodwill. Anyway, um, so there's a lot of people still making memories I can't with 360s. people don't delete their profiles before they get rid of those things. You don't believe that, really? That's stupid. I mean, People are stupid. I have ads. a bunch of 360s <laughs> that I want to get rid of that are from like old G4, and I'm like, I'm yeah. like, I got to go through this and make sure there's no like info on these things, and I'm too lazy to actually because you have to swap the hard drives and all this stuff, and I'm just like, yeah. eh, tomorrow I'll throw them in the closet. They've been in the closet for seven years. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> people are reminding us that the first Destiny was cross gen. I'm pretty sure I would have played it on the new Probably. systems. Yeah. Um, let's see what else you guys had to say about 360 in here. Sneaky says I had three Red Ring consoles. I had one. I did have a total of three different Xbox 360 consoles, though. And I think that's the mm. only console that I could ever say I have a about. bunch of them just because of I ended up with some from when G4 shut down. Well, I got one, like, so I got I the one. I only had the two. I had the. Okay. I still have the, the Slim that I got to replace. The mm -hmm. first one, I, I'm i trying to think. Which, I, I, my PS3 is the launch one. Uh, the, Wii is, the Wii had to be replaced. The oh. Wii broke. Interesting. And that the, probably never happens. And my GameCube broke. My my launch GameCube died. It got some some weird thing, and I had to go get another one. And that's when I learned that new GameCubes did not have the digital out port, and so I had to bring it back and go find one that did. Yeah. Um, now I, the, most most consoles have lasted okay for me. I had the OG 360 that red ringed, and then I went and bought the new was it Slim or whatever the new model was. The, it was the, the, the thing that we just showed. Yeah, that wouldn't red good. ring. Yeah. And then Microsoft sent me basically the same one, a little bit of a change, but it had like a 500 gig hard drive in it or whatever. Yeah, they would just do little expand like. So I gave things. my retail unit two game trailers and was like, okay, now we have another, or another retail unit to use in here. And then I took that new one that they sent me to replace the one that I gave to GT. So, um, and I still have that third one with the 500 gig one to this day. So, but it's the only console I ever had that I had three of them. Mm. That just never happened before. I had, I have three Dreamcasts. Oh yeah? Because you collect them for colors? No, or... I have the, I have the Japanese one, which I got when that came out for that. When that came out, I was a Christmas present. Mm-hmm. Uh, that my mom spent way too much money on, especially when <laughs> all, I, all I had to play was Godzilla Generations. And she's like, this is what I paid $800 for. And I'm just like, well, it's going to be better stuff next week. Sonic comes out. Um, and then um, I, had a, I had the U.S. one when that came out. Mm -hmm. And then I have a third one that I think. The 2K Sports black one? No, it was given. I got it because like someone at G4 didn't want theirs anymore. Nah. So I just took it. Yeah. So I had a backup. I'll take it off your hands. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I have a few. I've be, over the years, I've gotten old, like some retro ones that are just like I have a extra Saturn in case I need it. Yep, I have a, an extra Turbo Graphics for no good reason. Um, but I still have my OG X Big X, but the Duke is still there. Was the only strong. one. <laughs> there was the only one. Uh, so anyway, nice little trip down memory lane, down Xbox's memory lane. Anyway, there. Uh, rest in peace, Xbox 360. You are a great friend. <laughs> Uh, some news that we got yesterday is that the voice of Mario, uh, Charles Martinet, who has been the voice of Mario since Super Mario 64, has decided to step down. He Before is, that, even. Was he? He was, he was the, was his, he? his first performance as Mario was in Mario's Game Gallery on the PC. Oh, really? And I thought it was also Mario, in Mario 64. Also in Mario's Teaches Typing. Mario 64 was where he was made the official permanent voice. Gotcha. But... He had done some spot um, done, duty. Oh, not spot duty. Mario Game Gallery is, the, is probably has more lines from him than the rest of his entire career. Combined. Right, but I'm saying he wasn't doing every game as Mario. No, well, every game he wasn't talking. Yeah. It was, it was, basically, you had to have a voice all of a sudden with the advent mm -hmm. of the N64. Mm -hmm. So they picked him because he'd already done some PC stuff. Yeah. 
Um, great guy. Honestly. Like, he's one of those people that you meet, and he's exactly what, what you think he's going to be. He's just, like, this awesome, affable guy. He'll sit there and talk to you as long as you want to talk to him. He'll sign autographs. He'll take pictures. Whatever. He's a really, really good dude. Um, why do you think that this has happened, Matt? Do you think he's just 67 he's in his 60, retirement time? Yeah, he's 67. And just, he's made his money. and Yeah. And clearly he wants to keep doing it to some degree because he's still the Mario ambassador or whatever. He's yeah, what does that of, even mean? That means he's still going to make public appearances, I think. But that's what I'm saying. It's like, why would he be willing to do that but not just spend a day doing voice for the new Mario know, game? It might be hard, hard in his voice. That's what I'm thinking. Mm-hmm. I think it's maybe getting to the point where it's rough for him to do the voice anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, people are trying to figure out what his last game was. People thought it might be Super Mario Brothers Wonder. It turns out that's not the case. There is a new mario voice actor in the new 2d mario game everybody panic yeah and what most people have come to the conclusion of is this game mario plus rabbits sparks of hope that would track um that's what a lot of people think some people are wondering if he has recorded stuff for the next 3d mario maybe Mm -hmm. that's Uh, possible or maybe, but, maybe DLC on this that's yet to come out. Maybe. And they just announced like the another piece of DLC for this as well. Uh, but yeah, a lot of people are trying to figure out like what was his last gig. And he hasn't come out and said yet what it is. And Nintendo mm. hasn't either. Actually, it might, almost, it might be uh, the movie. Maybe. Because he's in that. I mean, he's Mario's father in that. But right. He, but he is also the voice of Jumpman and does the, uh-huh. the, the little gag where he's like, ah. Like, yep. It's, it's, you know, also, that's another thing. Go look up uh, Mario Game Gallery on YouTube. There's a YouTube thing that has all of, basically it's all the voice clips all in one thing. And try to imagine that movie, 90 minutes of that crap. Yeah. Like, (laughs) no, I mean, I know everybody doesn't like Chris Pratt and all, and he's a weird pick for that voice, but you could not have that voice in a feature film for the whole run. Come on. Well, it'll be interesting to see how the new person sounds because... I imagine it'll sound exactly like it because that's one of the easiest voices to replicate. It is easy, but there's a lot of, like, characters through time that have gotten new voice actors to, that to me don't sound anything like oh 100 percent. but like like a lot of them are like characters in serial commercials like tony the tiger and like captain well, crunch no, I mean, and like nobody is gonna is gonna be able to match uh what's it, the guy who did uh tony tony that was uh, yeah. that's the same guy who did uh mr grinch yep yeah. And uh, yeah. and all that stuff. You know, but there's it, a lot of game characters too where that's happened. Like I can always tell the difference for whatever reason. But yeah, but here, it's, eventually you Mario, get over Mario it. is not. I mean, I know it's, <laughs> it's. I know it's like gaming blasphemy, but I don't like his voice for Mario. Oh, I have okay. I have hated that voice since the first second of the Mario 64 title <laughs> screen. I think it's incredibly dumb. I don't understand why a guy from Brooklyn sounds like that. Yeah. It's ridiculous. And so, yeah, whatever. Like, everyone I know can do a decent impression of that voice, so I'm sure it won't be that hard to replace it. Yeah. Like, Martinette seems like a good dude, mm-hmm. um, and I'm glad he got a steady gig out of it for 30 years, uh, because, like, not a lot of people get to do that in voice acting. No. Nope. Um, but, like, yeah, I cannot possibly express to you how much I did not have any kind of reaction to this news. It's, yeah. it's com- a complete non-event to me because, A, I don't like the voice very much, and, B, it's extremely easy to replace. So yeah. it's not like Optimus Prime. As these people struggle for a Peter Cullen replacement. It's weird how people struggle with a Kermit yeah. replacement. <laughs> isn't it? But they like, haven't. It's different. He does sound different. He does sound very different. Yeah. And it's weird because, like, you know, every straight white guy Can has a Kermit, Kermit voice, frog. right? Yeah. We all we all have a Kermit voice. You know, yeah. it's like it's it's like uh, everyone can do that voice, yeah. and it's like you could do. A but open they can't casting. find. They do can find, but there's people that have kind of you know dom you know they have claims on it basically. Yeah. Um, it's it's just whatever. Yeah. Like it, 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 but yeah, I, I was like, oh, they're gonna go with Chris Pratt. Like, Nintendo's too cheap to pay for Chris Pratt yeah. every time they do a video game. Well, voice. I'm truth sorry. be told. Mario doesn't talk much in any no, of the games. Doesn't. Like, it's not like he has lines that you read. It's no. basically just sound effects of him grunting and whatever. Yeah. So, and theoretically, you just use that forever. You could. You have already have the samples. Just I'm reuse honest, them. I'm honestly surprised, and maybe this is what they're doing. I don't know. I'm so surprised he didn't just license his voice to Nintendo as like an AI, AI. thing, the way James Earl Jones did for Darth Vader. Or just didn't go and record a whole bank of. Because what you can do is you can record your voice saying 
X number of words, and then AI yeah. can pick it up and just turn your voice yeah, into well, whatever you want. Ja- that's what James Earl Jones did. Yeah. And that's what they're using. Uh, they're using a combination of him and the AI and, uh, and uh, Hayden Christensen in the Obi-Wan Kenobi series, and it sounds great. Mm-hmm. It sounds like Darth Vader again, as opposed to like, oh, Darth Vader like sounds a little old in Rogue yeah. One. Um, <laughs> that's hilarious. But like... Uh, <laughs> Geriatric Vader. I mean, he just got out of the tank. It's probably yeah. it's rough on the throat. <laughs> <laughs> yep. But, um, yeah, it's uh, I that would not surprise me because, again, you take a, you know, I'm going to retire. Give me a huge lump sum while I can still do the voice well to, like, give you a bank of stuff you can use forever. Yeah. Like, that that's reasonable yeah. to me. I, I agree. Think. Yep. Uh, next up, game you're really excited for, and me too, Marvel Spider-Man 2. Insomniac announced this week that it has accessibility options inside the game where you can slow down the gameplay to like 30%, 50%, 70%. <laughs> I know you don't care about this, and I don't care about this, because we both are on the same level mm. where we say we want everyone to be able to play games as much as possible, but there are gatekeepers out there who do not agree with us on this stuff. How do you think they feel about this? Do you think even they are like, we get it? Fuck them. <laughs> I don't care what they care, think about it. Yeah. I really don't. Like, yeah. I really, I really could, I mean, I die mad about it. I really don't care. Yeah, like, I don't either. I do personally know three people who couldn't play the original games because the combat's too fast for them. Mm. Because they have disabilities in their hands uh-huh. or because they just don't have the ability to process things fast enough because they have, they have like, visual processing issues. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, don't. and now they're, they're going to be able to play this one. So, fuck off. Yeah. Don't care. Also, like, if you can do that, think about how cool some of the fucking replays can be. I know. Like, like you can actually use that as a tool to, like, really dig into the inf- animation on this game and look how good, cool the fights look. I mean, I might use it just for fun. Yeah. Like, that's... I, I mean, would play fuck, the whole game that way. Sake, but... Zack Snyder's entire career is based on doing this. Why can't you fucking do it in this? Like, <laughs> yeah. give me a break. Go home. Yeah. Get a life. Seriously. As, James, as William Shatner or said. Just go out and touch grass. Yeah. <laughs> So anyway, I think it's awesome. I think it's just in general, this entire thrust across the entire industry to make games playable by everybody is incredible. I've talked about my friend who had a stroke at a very young age who loves games and can't play. I sent him the video for the new PlayStation accessibility controller and the Xbox. And he's like, wow, I didn't even know this stuff was happening. Um, To me, it's awesome to see um, they are trying to make games playable for everybody. And I would hope that ultimately in 10 years from now, Every game would be doing stuff this yeah, way. Certainly, every game with a budget to do to right. They can afford be able, to be yeah. able to put that in. For Even sure. some indie games that are starting to they don't well, go full, co- full throat. No, but. but I think as you codify this and, and give people you know sort of more general tool. I mean, like maybe that's not a pr- applicable here, but it's like generally if you add in an accessibility feature like an Unreal game, anyone who makes an Unreal game after that is going to be able to access that tool. Right. Yeah. So, like, it will become easier and easier to uh-huh. put this sort of stuff into a game that even doesn't, wouldn't have a budget to innovate yep. this kind of thing. Totally true. So, yeah, it's just going to get better and better. It's just, it's all to the good, in my opinion. Anybody who says otherwise, you shouldn't listen to. That's all i got to say about it. Um, let's see. Next up. So, everyone's still talking about Diablo 4. By the way, Diablo 4 was still the second best-selling game from last month which by the way matt remnant 2 was the number one selling game last month it beat pikmin 4 well that's not super surprising uh, it, to me it was it's on more platforms yeah still Multi- though multi-platform makes a difference yeah i mean remnant 2's a hit like yeah sure i mean also it's they'll make another one i mean they put it out at the right time yeah just just before Baldur's gate just in time to have nothing else for people to do yeah um yeah well, people are still talking about Diablo 4, which makes it strange timing for Blizzard to announce this. But Blizzard has announced that Diablo 3 is finally getting a single player mode. After 11 years or whatever of people asking for it, like they finally is going to be a dedicated single player mode in Diablo 3. It's coming in season 29, Matt. There's been 29 seasons of Diablo 3. And they're not done either. So I didn't even know what the, what does that mean. What does what mean? Player mode. I played I played Diablo three by myself, so I don't know what. It's like a dedicated mode where you don't you can't people can't come in and help like even if you wanted them to like. Mm. Um, but fans have been asking for it for eleven years. It's been the most requested feature in Diablo three all this time, and they're finally giving it to fans. It, it sounds to me like they're trying to put the cap on Diablo three. 
and say, okay, <laughs> you can let's move on to you guys complaining about Diablo 4 for the next 11 years now. <laughs> like mm-hmm. We're going to give you what you've been asking for, um, and we'll move on, and hopefully you guys can move on too. So anyway, better late than never, I guess. And I guess it does show, too, that Blizzard cares about its fans, like, way past the honeymoon period when it releases games even or though maybe people, they just need a win that could be too because you're right the last couple weeks of diablo 4 have not been full of, of wins by any stretch of the imagination um it's been interesting to watch a game like have very little interest and then launch huge after its awesome beta and everybody loves it at launch everyone finishes the campaign Everyone complains, and it's, it's, the vibe for the game goes all the way down again. Like, it's just been this seesaw for Diablo 4. And I guess, ultimately, it was kind of that way for Diablo 3 as well, because we're seeing them now add a mode this far mm-hmm. down the road, which is just really crazy. Well, Diablo 3 started way more negative than 4 did. That's true, yeah. Because the auction house and right. all that. And yep. then went back up, and then went back and then went down. Back to- <laughs> it's insane. Blizzard fans are crazy. That's one thing I've learned across the last, like, I don't know, two years between, like, the mobile Diablo game. Like, just. Well, and also, I'd imagine 70% of the people that played Diablo 3 and Diablo 4 don't even know any of that happened. Maybe. You know, there's like, because you, yeah. you play the game, you do the game, you move on to your move on with your life. These are the people that are just, that's, they're just trying they're to. They're stuck there. They want to play this forever and end game it and do seasons and ladders and all that. And it's like, then work right. Yeah. So, yeah, I guess so. It's a vocal minority, I guess, is what you're getting at. Yeah. Uh, but they're the people that keep buying your crap, so yeah, you gotta you gotta support it somehow. Yep. Um, and then also this week, it, yet another Steam Deck competitor leaked. One is coming from Lenovo now, so that's what four, sure, including the original Steam Deck. So three clones and a real Steam Deck. Why do you think this is exploding so much? PC handhelds because they sell. But why? I'm saying why. Like, why do they sell so much? Why do you no think people idea. want to take their I, PC games on the road? I have road? no idea. I think it's incredibly stupid, and especially for the amount of money these people charge for it. The market's obviously becoming saturated. Yeah. I mean, like the Rogue, I haven't seen any sales numbers for the Rogue Ally no, to know no. how it's doing. I um, think I think it's the antithesis of what I want from PC gaming. Like, it's just right. Like, like I want the grounded tower. Yeah, that I want just, power right. and, and visual. I'm just like, I don't want, I don't care about like, yeah, it's, I, I don't I, get I, it either. It's mystifying. And for the price <laughs> of know. this stuff, it's like, you could just get an actual graphics card for that. Right? You're right. Because the it's, other thing too, is it like these new clones of steam deck are more expensive. They yeah. keep going up in yeah, price. You think it was be, it would be like, we're we'll going to beat, the cheaper we're gonna beat valve at the pricing and that's how we get in. No, it's they just not. keep going out into yeah. the, black beyond like i don't get it either but i do think that the market is saturated and there's more um competitors in the market than can be supported by the market so you're gonna have an industry crash here probably lenovo and asus are both gonna wash out and be left with steam deck the other thing too is that now valve is selling refurbished steam decks Mm -hmm. so you can now get steam decks for like way lower than what you would pay retail and that might actually help what is the someone else played this on the toilet discount right uh i think it was like 30 percent or something like that Mm -hmm. maybe 40 percent it was significant like it when it was all said and done it was like 100 bucks off um, on most models of steam deck so um, that's encouraging if you've actually been waiting for a steam deck and you're like man i can't i can't swing it Go check out the refurbs. Like, they're selling for way cheaper than retail. And I guess I would also say, like, I would still probably recommend buying Valve's Steam Deck versus any of the other well, I mean, competitors. They're, they're, they're the best price if you absolutely mm-hmm. have to have that for some reason. I also feel better about the longevity of it if you buy Valve's versus buying a Lenovo or an Asus Rogue or whatever. Mm-hmm. Like, I feel like if those go away, if you have a problem with them, getting support's going to be difficult. Like, I would just prefer to just stay in the Valve ecosystem and stick with mm-hmm. Valve if I could. Uh, but anyway, if you're in the market, there's tons of options coming. But also, most importantly, the price for the real Steam Deck has gone down if you're willing to take a refurbed unit. And I'll be honest with you, I have no problem with refurbed units of anything. Like, generally, they go through a painstaking process before they put them back up for sale. And again, I trust Valve to do that. Would I trust Lenovo or Asus? Probably not as much. I would not buy a refurb any of those things really no there's always going to be wear on the components there's always going to be wear on the sticks there's always but if be... you well the sticks for sure that's that's no, without a doubt but like i've read like done some research on like components and like pc components do not like the more you use them it doesn't affect their value per se like they they don't wear out so to speak sticks do definitely. i'm more concerned about the actual handheld components yes those are the things that are being, mm-hmm. being treated roughly yep. and they're the things you can't you can't predict when a 
stick's going to drift or when a stick's going to break. That's true. One good thing about these, though, is none of them have moving parts. So they don't have, like, it's not like a PSP where you have, like, a drive in there and there's mechanical parts that mm -hmm. move that can break. They're all pretty much just solid state, so that helps. But typically my experience with refurbs have been good. Like, a lot of times, like, they just call them a refurb because they have to. Like, somebody bought it, had it for a week, sent it back, and, like, just because they didn't like it or whatever. They do all their tests on it. It's good to go. But you're right. There is an X factor there. And the older the Steam Deck gets, the more you're playing with those numbers because mm -hmm. the more likely the chance is that somebody had that Steam Deck for, like, a year and a half and then sent it in or whatever. So you're right. The longer Steam Deck is available on the market, the more likely you are to get burned by a refurb. So that's definitely worth considering. Um, next up, NBA 2K24. Matt, if you ever need a harbinger of things to come in the games industry as far as pricing and slimy financial practices are concerned, the NBA 2K franchise is your boy. Mm. It, 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 for whatever reason, it was the first to go to $70. It was the first to do some slimy stuff last year with its microtransactions. And now this year... It is the first game to announce a second season pass for $20 that you can pay for. So there's two. There's the typical $10 season pass that most games have, and this game has had for how many years now? Mm -hmm. And now they've introduced the $20 one, which again, just lets you skip even more of the crap and get the stuff that you want without having to, to play for it instead of pay for it. They're basically just allowing you to pay to win with the game. You're going to get access to stuff much easier than someone who's just playing the game. I saw some figures on NBA 2K and like basically to max out like what most people play in NBA 2K, it's a hundred bucks. So you buy the game for $77 or whatever, and then mm -hmm. you spend another hundred dollars. But it's remarkable how much like nobody talks about the, predatory pricing and and stuff like that in the sports game market because the people who get so mad about that stuff generally don't care about sports games that well here's the other reason why matt is it because and it's not just sports games either people who get into games as a service they're the only games they play mm -hmm. they, they're not like us they're not excited about starfield in a week they weren't excited about baldur's gate 3 last week and they weren't excited what, about what if i charge them 20 bucks for extra ship parts would they be excited then? Maybe they enjoy the game then. <laughs> they, they don't like a game unless they're getting fleeced. But yeah. but the, the thing is, is like to them, they're like, well, look, if I spend $100 a year on NBA 2K24, that's still less than you're, you're spending on video games in a year. And I still had a blast all year long. So there is kind of an argument for it. And that's about it. what they spend on it for, for a night out at the movies. Yeah. So there is kind of an argument for it. Like, if this is, like, what you're into, if you're really in NBA 2K, you run a YouTube channel that's just NBA 2K, and you, you hope maybe to one day be, you know, an eSports participant in NBA, then the 100 bucks maybe not such a big deal. But when we see this outwardly, the problem is, is that when they do this, it sets a precedent for the other games that aren't NBA 2K. I mean, look at how many games are $70 now. NBA 2K was the first to do it. So... A lot of, in a lot of ways, Take-Two opens the barn door for everybody else to run through. Well, I think Take-Two just does, like, isn't afraid of the bad press or the bad reaction because they're Take-Two. Maybe. It's like, it's like, basically, it's like, we can do whatever the hell we want with NBA 2K because A, most of you aren't paying attention, and B, uh, when it comes down to it, we're going to put out GTA 6 and none of y'all care. It won't matter. <laughs> Our brand. <laughs> Who, who's going to boycott us because we've raised the price of the game to $70? The first raise in... Yeah. game pricing since 2005 right. I might add it's it, it's not that it's not that serious if you remember it, when this happened we were both kind of surprised that nobody cared like yeah. nobody really pushed back on $70 games because I think we all understood like yeah it's kind of time yeah like but again NBA 2K was the first one to take that bold step mm -hmm. and but take again two. it's like okay if you're really mad about it or whatever they're doing here or whatever don't buy GTA 6 yeah yeah, not gonna happen. <laughs> That's not gonna happen. Definitely not. They're but invincible may, and they know it. But it may keep people from buying a, a, a lazy port like Red Dead that they just put out, or yeah, the GTA well, trilogy. I think that would have happened whether you raise the price to seventy bucks or put the, the second season. Well, people would have just like, refused to buy it yeah. without it. I mean, the Red Dead thing came and went without anybody barely even noticing. Well, as it turns out, the ports aren't that bad. Like no. the Switch version of the game actually looks pretty good. It's fine, but it's like it still <laughs> it still costs too much, yeah. and it's just you know, it's like okay, that's a thing. Yeah. And next, it was like, it was nothing. Yeah. Like, there was no reaction. It was honestly honestly, if it'd been a bad port, 
it would probably would have gotten more publicity. And probably maybe it would have sold People better. People still would have been talking about it. <laughs> It's messed up. Uh, moving on, um, as I've talked about before here on the show, I'm a very proud owner of some PlayStation 5 black plates um, that I have used to adorn my PS5, and now my PS5 is all black, and I love it. Um, but unfortunately, if you're an Xbox Series X owner, there's really no way to customize your consoles until now. Well, but luckily, it's not bright white, so it's not that yeah, urgent. Yeah, it's true. Um, until now, um, Microsoft has announced an official program where you are going to be able to wrap your Xbox Series X console. Now, it's got to be one of the easiest things to produce because it's literally just a rectangle. Mm -hmm. It's not like, because that's the thing. Like, I have a buddy, actually, who owns a car wrapping business back in central Pennsylvania. And, dude, he's doing gangbusters. He's become, he had a detailing business that languished for, like, 20 years, barely making enough to get by. He switched it to a car wrap business, and he's literally a millionaire. Within three years, he became a millionaire and stopped working and going to work. Car wraps are a big deal, but the yep. problem with car wraps is it's hard. You can't, not just anybody can do it because of the curves. But when you're talking about Xbox Series X, it's literally just a cube. And so anybody could wrap that and do a good job. And I think Microsoft has figured that out. Well, so, it almost just looks like a cozy. Yeah, it does. <laughs> like a it's beer like, koozie or whatever. Xbox cozy. <laughs> yeah, it does. I wonder if you even just like slide it down over no, the console. It, it, actually, you wrap it around. Oh, you do wrap it? it. You fasten it. Oh, okay. It's actually, it actually is like a. Like a cozy, it's it's, yeah. it's an Xbox coat. It's like a does it have Velcro to secure it? I think it does. Does it? Yeah, I think it's like an X. It's like a it's like a coat for your Xbox. Interesting. Uh, so the first ones are there's like two camo and Starfield are the first three, but you can only imagine that eventually this is going to be a huge thing. Uh, look, if Microsoft can create a whole business around customizing your controllers. Raps, no big deal. Yeah, but one day maybe Velocity Girl will finally get to sell that t shirt. <laughs> That's right. That never happened. No. Nope, she never, never got happened. to sell it. Uh, so, anyway, if you're a Series X owner and you've been a little bit jealous of the plates on PlayStation 5, fear not. There are customization options coming. And then the final piece of housekeeping, and this rolled in this morning along with Gamescom, is a brand new Atari 2600 console. <laughs> it was announced this morning. It's called the Atari 2600 plus and it's legit it play you can plug in your cartridges and play them it is literally an atari 2600 and it not only plays atari 2600 games it also plays like the the sequels that came afterwards those cartridges as well it comes with a mega cart quote unquote that includes like five games when you buy it um and then you can just get your old carts and plug them in and they still play it's going to sell for like $140, and it launches, I think, November 17th or something like that. Uh -huh. What do you think about this? I don't. You don't? <laughs> I, I wonder if the stick, the covers on the sticks will tear off the same way the And if the plastic sticks did. in the side yeah. will break. Um, I'm sorry. These games suck. They do suck, yeah. Like, this, was, this is a moment in time. This was a best we could do kind of thing. Yeah. And even then, That's exactly it what it was. It wasn't really right, right. that good. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, th I mean, I was around for these, and I have no nostalgia for 2600 games whatsoever. Yeah. I mean, I'll play a game around a cosmic arc, if you make me. I enjoyed Warlords, but there's an arcade version of that that's better. Um, this is just the best they could do for a mass market console at the time. Like I appreciate the paneling. Like, yeah, they, they really I, went the extra step here. I mean, yeah, that's, that's what, that's what the home, home electronics looked like in, in 1977. The, in the 70s, but yeah. like, um, I, yeah, I don't, why would I ever want to play this shit again? Yeah. For a hundred and something. Are you kidding? Even though I have a, a I do, stack I, of like 200 Atari 2600 oh, I cartridges. Have, I don't have any of that. I never owned one of these. Really? I, never, I know. I was too, too young for that. Yeah. I, like I had some friends whose parents bought them one like as like, you know, when I was, you know, we, we were like, we would have been like five or six. Yeah. I caught and the it tail was, end I would already like 82, you know, yeah. and like, so by that, it was ColecoVisions and Intellivisions and ColecoVision and Intellivision were more of yeah. my God, era, I, I but I still like, had one of these. I even like Vectrex better than this. Yeah. Are you kidding? Well, what happened for me was my aunt, who is older than me, obviously, gave me her entire Atari 2600 mm -hmm. collection. And she was like a spoiled brat. She was like the third child, but both her sisters were like 15 years older than her. And her parents, obviously, at that point were very wealthy. And so she got anything she wanted. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, she just gave me her whole collection. So Justin Horman saying it says seventy two hundred games, which makes sense because obviously the um, 
5200 games will definitely not work because 5200 game cartridges are gigantic and right. they won't fit in that slot. Yeah, but the 7200 does. 7200 is the same cartridge. Yeah. yeah, the same cartridge same size. Same size and interface, yeah. Because yeah. 7200 could play 2600 games. Shiniki says that's even before my dad's time, yeah. A lot of people but would 5, say 5200 was 5200 is ridiculous. 5200 looks more like the Jaguar. Yeah. It was gigantic. It was like big enough to eat a like put a dinner plate on. 5200 was gigantic. Yeah. It was. And yep. had the stupid controller with the die. Like, you couldn't play those horrible. games. You couldn't play those games on this in part because you, you'd you need the the phone keypad. Right, right. You that. needed a special controller. Yeah. Yeah. So, anyway, I do wonder, like, why is there so much Atari 2600 stuff that happens? Like, I think because it's easy to get the license and there's, like, an element of remembering it or whatever. I mean, I don't know. At least this came Even out people of, like us from that era or kind of from that era, even we don't care that much I about it. I like, don't know. I mean, I have a friend who, like, actually doesn't play video games anymore. Like, you know, back, he did back in the day and kind of quit in the 90s. But, like, because he realized he had to, you know, either not do that anymore or only do that. And, yeah. Like, he just, he figured, <laughs> but he, I mean, he asked me sometimes, he's like, oh, can you build me, like, one of those Raspberry Pi things and put, like, uh, Atari 2600? He wants to Atari 2600 Why? games on it because that's what he Why? played with his dad. That's all he played. Yeah. Well, he played with his dad back in the mm-hmm. day. That's what he wants. But I was yeah. like, I'm like, you're going to play Stella. Yars Revenge for five seconds and then be like, I don't need to do this to myself anymore, and that's it. Yeah. Which is fine. You know, who cares? But it's also... For that price, that's ridiculous. Yeah, like that's, that's way too much. You could I mean, probably go. You could probably get an actual Atari Twix hundred Twix hundred for less than that. You're right, it, but it won't play the seventy eight eight hundred or whatever. Yeah, games. well, name me one Atari seventy eight hundred <laughs> game you want to play right now. Well, I mean, honestly, Matt, I can only name like five Atari twenty six hundred games that are worth playing now. Yeah, like five out of a thousand mm-hmm. that hold up. Like games you'd give you give to someone who'd never touched one before. I don't even know if I can think. River five. Raid. River Raid is good. Well, I mean, I don't know if River, River Raid is impressive. It's still time. good. Yeah. It's still fun um, to play. It's still challenging and exciting. And nobody ever gives that woman credit for making it. No. It's a shame. And I most of them are Activision games, honestly. Yeah, the Activision stuff is the best. Cosmic Arc is also Activision. They were like the naughty dog of the Atari uh, 2600 Atlantis era. was yeah. good. That was yeah. also Activision. Yep. Um... Yeah, and I, Barnstormer. Uh, like I said, Warlords <laughs> is pretty good. <laughs> yeah. But Warlords was like... An arcade game first and it's better in the arcade game yeah um, yeah same with defender same with i mean Pac-Man. that was really the achilles heel of the atari 2600 is that it looks so terrible compared yeah. to the arcade i mean and that's what of, people compared it to back then i mean some of it's just like oh here's history play et just so you know what everybody's <laughs> oh, talking about don't don't that is one of those games that lives up to the reputation of yeah. being abysmal but i would argue that everybody should play it once just to see what it is so Everybody really. should try to get out of the pit in a yeah. PT. Good luck. And now imagine <laughs> doing that as a kid in 1982 and like, there's no internet. There's no, yeah. like, are you doing it wrong? Is it, yeah. is it, bro- there's no way to know. There's no way to know. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Okay. So that does it for housekeeping for today's show. Before we get going, we want to check in. Oh, I'm sorry. We need to check in with you guys after I get you guys synced into the TriCaster. Uh, unfortunately, our PC restarted. And so I have to get you guys back in there. But there you are. And let's check in. I saw a bunch of you guys subscribing with Twitch Prime. It's bizarre. Like, usually, like, the first two episodes of the month, we get a ton. And then nothing for the rest of the month. But for whatever reason, all three episodes, we've been getting a ton of you guys giving us Twitch Prime, which is amazing. Mm. Let's see what you guys are saying. (laughs) Ninja Golf. What? Ninja Golf? 7800 game. Oh. Ninja Golf was pretty good. Yeah. Also, like, at least this exists as opposed to the Amico. Um, okay, well, this won't let me. There we go. Okay. Let's see here. A Fruit Eater. Thank you for Twitch Prime. Um, Eric Cartman is, I paid less than $25 and bought two copies of 2K23. Well, now it's on, like, PlayStation Plus or whatever. Mm-hmm. Like, 2K, yeah, 2K23. You can get it for free. Yeah, those definitely have a shelf life. Yeah. Um, Shneeky says Fortnite has also started doing two season passes together now. Interesting, because everybody's reporting the 2K stuff is the first ever in the industry. So, sounds like that they're wrong. Um, Maybe Erebus, it's tiered things? I don't know. Erebus says, to be fair, they add new stuff to Diablo 3 every season. They do. I mean, I'm not saying that, like, the 29 seasons don't have anything in it. Like, um, and Vincent reminds us that Pikmin 4 doesn't include digital on MPDs, but I don't think any game does, do they? I don't think... I mean, it's still it's an apples to apples comparison. Are you insinuating that Nintendo games sell more digital than other platforms? I don't know that that's the case. Mm. I think that it's just it just didn't sell very well. It's just the sad truth. Um, uh, I don't know what they're talking about with Uncharted there. 
Thoughts on Mario's voice for audiobooks <laughs> from Cinetike. <laughs> oh my sure. god, Matt. That's your own personal hell, Matt. If you had to go someplace where they the just... The best of times, it wasn't the worst of times. <laughs> what is... I don't know why Mario became Irish at the end of that. That would be hilarious. Uh, Gohan, Rachel... Why does he sound like that? He's from Brooklyn. Yeah. It's so weird. Yeah. Gohan says, my launch game keeps stopped reading discs. I had to buy a refurbished one direct for Nintendo. I made sure they gave me the digital out version. That's important because they yeah. did switch eventually and they got rid of the uh, component output on the GameCube mm -hmm. in the later versions. Um, Erebus reminds us that the 360 included a free decent headset. That is absolutely That's true. true. And yeah. I use it for a long time. I use it so long that the cups that went around the ear thing, like the phone thing, started yeah, disintegrating. Yeah, <laughs> That's how long off. I used it. And it still worked after the cups started disintegrating. Um, what else we got here? Connect was for enterprise uses. Yeah, I know. There was like... And there's, there actually, if you put like your Connect up on eBay, like you can sell it for a good bit of money because there's people out there who just use it for like weird DIY yeah. projects, like mocap things. Yeah, it's so, kind of yeah. cool actually that it's people have found a use for it after all this time. Um, this chat is so weird. Why won't it let me scroll up anymore? I guess it's all going to let ran me go. Out, ran out of memory. That sucks because I saw a ton of Twitch Prime people up there. I apologize that we aren't going to be able to say thank you on the I show. I might be able to get there. My phone is better than that. And maybe be. Matt can get back there. I don't know why they do this with the desktop version. It's so dumb. It's like know. you would think on desktop there would be an um, infinite scroll. We got uh, Twitch Prime. We got McWomble. Thanks, McWomble. Um, the Surly Mexican. Another regular. Thank you. R. Diana 45. Another regular. Thank you. Robert uh, Diana. You used to be on the site, and I don't see you on the site anymore. What happened to you? Ryan He. Ryan He. Ryan Hi. Okay. Thank you, Ryan. Uh, MHG and Morton Joe. Regular. On a stream every week. Thank you. Costas. Costas CKIP. Custic IP. Okay. Rock and Roll 458. Awesome. Thank you. The Legacy. We know the Legacy. Shora F. No, sure. F. Who uh, works? What game does he work on? Does he uh, work at Naughty Dog or something? He was at Ghost, Ghost, Ghost Story Games. Ghost Story All Games. Right. But earlier in the chat, he said he was laid off. Oh, sorry to hear that, man. Um, really sorry to hear that. Iviz. Yep. Another regular. Thank you, Iviz. And that's the end of the chat. Okay. I told you. I knew there was a bunch of you guys. Thank you, Matt, for going back and checking that out. So we can thank all the people for doing good stuff for us that I asked for. So if I'm going to ask for it, you know you're going to get a thanks when you actually do it. Uh, we're and now we have Mershes and Majora Tom 91 Awesome. Thanks, guys. And thanks for tuning in live. I really thought today's show we were going to have nobody on the stream because of the Gamescom thing. You I've, really overestimate who cares about Gamescom. Maybe. But I just figured people would be like, I just watched two hours of a gaming stream. I don't want to watch more. I think more people would be like, I just had two hours of a gaming stream in the background while I was doing other things. Maybe. And now I'm going to have another, another game one in the background. For three hours <laughs> in the background. I'll if do you're doing things. that right now, that's totally cool. We, we'll take our audience however we can get it. So, all right, we're just about ready to kick off the show proper. But before we do that, it's time to hear from LS Cream. LS Cream is a fine cream liqueur created by fellow gamer and sifter Stevens Charles. It's inspired by an ancestral recipe from Haiti called Cray Mass and a double gold winner for its original taste at the New York Wine and Spirit International Competition. Ellis Cream can be enjoyed on the rocks or as a mixer for drinks with its rich blend of fresh cream and neutral grain spirits with notes of coconut, vanilla, cinnamon, and nutmeg. It's great in coffee or to make espresso martinis. To learn more, discover amazing drink recipes, or to track down your own bottle using a handy store locator, head to creamls.com slash sifted. That's creamls.com slash sifted. So fantasy football draft season is coming up. And Matt, I don't know if you if you heard back in the day when I started the big fantasy league at G4, that is still going today, by the way, now 20 years later or whatever. But I used to throw legendary parties for my fantasy football drafts. I remember drafts. those. Yeah. Um, and I still do for some of them, not all of them. A lot of people don't want to go to a party anymore. They just like, I just want to spend 90 minutes doing the draft online. Mm -hmm. But even in those leagues, there'll be a few people who want to get together. My Philadelphia fantasy football league that's been going for 26 years or 27 years at this point, which is crazy. 
we do a huge party. Like, we do a blowout party where I go back to Philly and all my friends show up. Even the people that aren't in the league show up. It's just this big blowout where we play horseshoes and we go out in the yard and shoot basketball. And it's just like this awesome all-day event. And I am taking LS Cream to that event. And I'm going to turn everybody on to LS Cream in my crew in Philadelphia. Um, and you guys should be doing the same. If you're warming up for your fantasy draft, you're getting ready to go do a big fantasy draft party, take some LS Cream. I guarantee you... That someone will ask you about it. So I took it to a Super Bowl party this year with mm -hmm. one of my buddies who is in my Philadelphia Fantasy League. He's the agent guy that I've talked about in the past, the electronic music DJ agent that is like mega rich or whatever. So I went to a Super Bowl party. I took Ellis Cream there, and what, people started asking about it. They found it on the bar, and they're like, what is this? And they made drinks with it, mm -hmm. and they started asking, like, where did this come from? Yeah. And I spoke up. I was like, I brought that. And they're like, well, I've never heard of it. Anyway... You'll be mm -hmm. shocked if you take LS Cream to a party, how people will like, yeah. like attach well, to it. Well, and also, this may sound like a strange endorsement, but my sister apparently let my niece try a little bit. Oh, <laughs> and well. My, and my niece hated it. Really? But my niece is 14. Right, right. So, and one of the reasons for that, it's not candy. Yeah, it's yeah. not just sweet, like yeah, milkshake yeah. stuff. It's got a very complex flavor. Yeah. It's got a, it's like, it's, it's not bite. for kids. I mean, yeah. it's not for kids because it's alcohol, but also right. it's not like, oh, it's like wine coolers. It's sweet. Yeah, yeah. No, like there's, there's some real stuff going on with this thing. Yeah. And you gotta, I think you need to have a more refined taste to like appreciate what's happening with this, with his grandmother's recipe. Cause she knew what she was doing. Back when so <laughs> I think, I think that's an endorsement that yeah. children don't like the liquor. Yeah. Right? Yeah. It's, yeah. It's exactly. Like you're doing it right. Well, back when I was your niece's age, we used to go downtown and we would find homeless people outside of convenience stores and we would give them like a dollar. Oh, she's 15. Sorry. She's 15. Oh, she's now. 15. We would, we I don't, would... I don't like how fast time moves. Yeah, I don't either. We would go to convenience stores and find homeless people outside the convenience store and give them five bucks and they would go in and they would buy us a bottle of Mad Dog 2020. Do you know what that is? Yeah, I remember the Mad cheapest Dog. wine that you can yeah. get. You could buy a pint bottle for like two dollars or whatever. And we would buy those, and then we'd buy a pack of Hubba Bubba Bubblegum. And what we would do is we would drink the whole bottle of Mad Dog 2020 and then put a piece of Hubba Bubba in our mouth and chew it immediately afterwards. And then like 10 minutes later, you were so drunk, you couldn't stand up. And, and then it would last for like 45 what, minutes, and it would be gone. What was the Hubba Bubba for? To, the flavor. Just to kill the flavor. That's what brought this up. Because it didn't, it didn't like get you drunk faster? It was just... Well, we pounded the whole right. bottle in one drink, and then we just throw the gum in so we didn't have to taste it. Mm. And it was like perfect. Oh, I thought you were like filtering it through the gum or something. No, no. Okay. <laughs> anyway, I'm not recommending that anybody does that. If you're underage, wait until you're 21 that is, to That is some... Pennsylvania ass <laughs> shit right there. That is... Yes, it is. That's what we did. Yep. Yeah. So anyway, um, <laughs> thanks to Ellis Cream. Awesome sponsorship. Go to creamls.com slash sifted. Uh, there's awesome drink recipes there for Labor Day. Even if you're not doing fantasy drafts, Labor Day is coming up. Get yourself a bottle of Ellis Cream and take it around to parties and see what happens. All right. And with that, it's time to kick off the show proper. And we're going to start... With easily the biggest reveal, and honestly, for our purposes, not, but for most people, the biggest reveal of the year. <laughs> Let's be honest. Like, they finally unveiled this week. In fact, except for those people, they don't even know it was unveiled. Right, they right. Pay attention yeah. to this. Yeah. Uh, but this week, Call of Duty Modern Warfare 3 was finally unveiled in full. In fact, if you watched Jeff Keighley's thing right before this, there was like a nine-minute chunk of gameplay that they showed pretty much right off the top of the show. Now, I didn't see that, but I did see the negative Twitter response to it. Oh, really? People didn't like it? People thought it was lazy-ass shit. Really? Because I don't, I don't, wasn't clear on why, but like people were like, this looks like ass. This because is this is the least lazy Call of Duty campaign maybe since Black Ops 2. People kept saying it was like doing kind of this weird thing that was, somebody said it was piggybacking off of what Infinite did. Somebody said, it was, it was very confusing to Interesting. me. Interesting. Because I didn't see it, so I okay. don't know what they're talking about. Well, one thing we're going to do here today is this trailer did air while we were here and I was doing like, getting ready for the show. Um, and so we weren't able to get it into the TriCaster. However, I have it up on the monitor here. And so for the live show, we're going to show you, it's not going to look as good, I guess. And then I'll swap it out for the direct feed of this trailer when I get home and I'm actually putting the show together for the people who watch the archive. But we're gonna show you the campaign footage that they showed today, albeit in not as amazing form. Um, here's the thing, like a lot of times when they unveil Call of Duty, you remember Matt how I was talking about how 
Um, usually by now they've unveiled Call of Duty. That happens mm -hmm. the week before E3, and then at E3 they get the second trailer, and then it gets this massive blowout after that. Well, this time they waited longer, and instead they just blew everything out at once. Like, usually you get the campaign, and then you get the zombies, and then you get the multiplayer. Instead, they decided to just include all that in the initial reveal. And so we have tons of information about Modern Warfare 3, the biggest of which is that Modern Warfare 3 is a direct sequel to Modern Warfare 2 from last year. So they're these so they use Did anyone doubt that? People are confused because so so there's already a Modern Warfare 3. That's the number 3. Now they use Roman numerals for this one and they did mm -hmm. it last year as well. And that sets it apart as this new reimagined version of the game or whatever. And really, it com these games completely rewrite the story and stuff in these games. They're completely mm -hmm. different. Like, for example, we talked last week, I think, about Makarov being in Modern Warfare 3, which is odd. Um, so these don't just assume that Modern Warfare 2 and Modern Warfare 3 are just like these slightly reworked versions of the original. They are completely different games. Um, and the biggest thing that this allows for, because they're working in concert with each other, is it allows them to carry things over from one game to the next. So the big story here with Modern Warfare 3 is that if you've already played Modern Warfare 2, you're going to hit the ground running with this. And I don't know if I like it, Matt. So basically how it works is um, the 16 launch maps from Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2 from 2009 have been modernized with new modes and gameplay features, and those will be available at launch. Um, and there are some classics. There's Afghan, there's Derail, Estate, Favela, which is just one of the greatest multiplayer maps in the history of Call of Duty. Uh, Karachi, High Rise and Invasion. There's Quarry, Rundown, Rust, Scrapyard, Skid Row, Subbase, Terminal, Underpass, and Wasteland. All those maps are gonna be there on day one. But again, they're maps that we have played before. Now, to play new maps, they're going to be a part of the season pass. So they have right now 12 brand new maps that they claim are already finished and ready to go. But they're rolling those out piecemeal as like the season pass rewards or as the season passes go, which is a little weird, I thought. But ultimately, in short order, you're going to have 28 maps for this game for the multiplayer, which is pretty freaking amazing. Um, there's also they've announced only one brand new mode so far. It's called Cutthroat. It's a competitive 3v3v3 mode, which is cool and rare. They don't do those a lot. Um, and then they're going to make sure that they use like fan favorite modes, um, like Hardpoint and Kill confirmed on those maps from 2009. Because back then, those modes didn't exist. So they've had to rework those maps slightly um, to make them work for these modes that have been introduced since those maps were first in um, the game from 2009. Um, and then there will be three huge environments at launch for ground war and invasion, and then a fourth, even bigger area for the colossal war map. And there's only going to be one of those. Um, every multiplayer weapon you currently have in your Modern Warfare 2 arsenal, along with all the, the parts and the attachments and everything, will just work in Modern Warfare 3. So when you boot this game up, the multiplayer, it's like you've already been playing it for like a year. There's all these maps that you already know from 2009 that you're playing, and then all the weapons that you know from the game from last year. So, so I don't know. Are, like, are none of the maps from last year's game? Coming to this game? Yeah. So far, they haven't talked about that yet, but my guess is probably. So all the maps launching to this game are reworks of maps from the original Modern Warfare 3. Modern Warfare or 2. Modern Warfare 2. It's confusing. I don't know why, but yes, that's that's what that's the plan. Well, I guess because Modern Warfare 3 didn't have a lot of good maps. Maybe. So. I mean... I mean, it, 2 was the pinnacle of the map design in a lot of people's opinion. Yeah, I'd agree with because that. Because that's when the, everybody left and formed, formed Respawn after yep. that. Yep. Um, I, it, even I remember the names of some of the things you listed there. Yeah. I mean, that's how iconic I mean, that Favela. Shit. If yeah. you don't know Favela, Favela, you didn't play Call of Duty. Um, <laughs> uh, what's the other one you said? The um, uh, Rust. Mm -hmm. uh, um, Quarry is a big one. High Rise Quarry. is a big one. What's the D one? You said it's one of the big of the D. Derail. Derail. I remember Derail. Yep. Yeah. Underpass. I mean, I know them all because I'm a huge COD player. But, um, but anyway... Uh, the multiplayer is going to be a hit the ground running experience. I don't know if I'm, I like that. Like, I like, kind of like starting from zero and constantly unlocking stuff. It's like, am I, I going to take. I don't think most people do. Really? I think that's the issue here. Interesting. I think that's, that, 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 I think this is a lot of focus testing saying that, like, we want 
You're probably right. Our progress to matter from year to year. Yeah, you're probably right. I'm and also, always, by the I've way, this trailer looks long... okay running in the show. <laughs> this yeah, gameplay. It looks, right. it looks I, okay. I've, I've said for a long time, I don't understand why they don't just make this an ongoing platform and just update the campaign every year. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, we've been saying that for years. Yeah. But that's never going to happen. Well, this seems like a, maybe this is a pretty baby close, step though. in that direction. Yeah. Uh, and then talking about the campaign, it is a direct sequel to last year's Modern Warfare 2, which, by the way, Matt, is like the best-selling Call of Duty ever. Mm-hmm. It's like people keep talking about Call of Duty falling off, Call of Duty slipping. Nope. It just sells more and more every freaking year. It's really crazy. Modern Warfare 2 is the best-selling Call of Duty ever just from last year. Um, And then the plot, they didn't give up a ton about what's happening, but the basic gist is that Captain Price and Task Force 141 face off against the ultimate threat, ultra-nationalist Vladimir Makarov. He's extending his grasp across the world, and Task Force 141 must stop him. Um, But here's the thing. So... This campaign is a potpourri of mission types. So it does have the typical Call of Duty, like, oh, my God, everything's exploding around me. There's all these set piece moments. It's very linear. The game is shoving you down a cattle chute. It has that stuff, but it also has just as many maps that are completely open. Um, they call them OCM, open combat missions. And basically they're like these open world missions that you can play however you want. Um, you can go in stealth if you want to, and just go in and stealth the whole mission. Although they said it's hard and you'll probably have to attempt the omit the mission multiple times. Mm-hmm. Or that, that must be what people talking about the, the infinite thing. Cause mm-hmm. infinite like made, made a stab in that direction where like you had, you could choose how you approach things. Mm-hmm. And it was the same thing. It was like, you can theoretically sneak your way through this whole thing. But, but good luck. You know, like, <laughs> I mean, they even kind of said as much. They're like, look, if you go stealth, it's tough. Like, you're going to have to yeah. really, like, figure it out and take the right gear with you. Um, it was really, and Infinite was really like, see how far you get. And then when it all goes loud, guns, like, there, guns I mean, blazing. at least you've killed, like, three guys yeah, already. You know, it's like, yeah. that's all. Uh, what they say, you have to make decisions and use different loadouts and plan different paths through every operation across the campaign. Um, and as I said, it also, you know, has the traditional, more linear missions for the campaign, because I think if they took those away, people would complain big time. I think a lot of people really like that stuff. And I like a few. Like, I think this is good. Like, I think having a mix of the stuff it is... Just, it still looks like every other shooter ever. Yeah. In front. I, mean, it, I mean, obviously it looks nice. Like mm-hmm. it's, it's a, it's a good graphics looking are very game. impressive, but it's like... yeah. Man, even like the five minutes I played, like the five, oh, I mean, I haven't played five minutes. I played like an hour of it, but like, five, like the hour I played of Avi, uh, Immortals of Avium, I'm just like, oh my god, every fucking shoot, first person shooter is the same thing. Yeah. It's just the same thing. And it doesn't even look as good as this. Yeah. It's like so weird. Why doesn't that game have HDR? Yeah. Why? Anyway, um, I, I, yeah, I, it's like you're either into this or you're not. And clearly, tons of people are into it because uh, of the sales of Modern Warfare 2. So it's an interesting experiment. To see if people would rather continue, you know, it is kind of weird that like arbitrarily every year you lose all the progress you made playing this game for you know twelve months. Like, I kind of enjoy it though because what it does is it helps me discover new guns, like somewhat. But I, I don't play the same gun like in every Call of Duty. Like one, I'll play the AK forty seven, but like I honestly haven't used an AK as my primary gun for like nine years or something yeah but there's still stuff that could stand i mean even the season stuff on like things like diablo have stuff that carry over. I mean, you're, you're getting permanent rewards out of it mm-hmm. that can you know be interesting even outside of that yeah um i think that's a smarter way of rewarding people for being loyal um and that might be their thinking on this i don't know if anyone will care yeah in the end i mean it seems almost like an automatic purchase for a large chunk of this yeah. audience. Oh, for so, sure. Like, yeah. does it even matter what you do? Like, I mean, to a certain extent, it does. The only, I mean, as long as you don't pull another ghosts, the like, sales still matter. Like yeah. the extra sales beyond the fans. But it's you know, I don't see that really being a problem as long as you don't do. As long, I mean, they they, they fucked up yeah. with with ghosts and arguably yeah. advanced warfare, and I guess infinite warfare. Even though that was a good game. Um, you know, it's clearly they're sticking to the hits at this point. I fully expect like Black Ops. You just mentioned like two of my favorite Call of Duties there, by the way. Oh, yeah, but <laughs> they didn't they sell. screwed it up. I know. It's like funny, I, Infinite Warfare it's is probably irony. my favorite. I thing love Advanced in the Warfare too. But like, it's like they didn't sell. Yeah, I know. Nobody fucking cared. It was very discouraging. So it was like, one of the more discouraging. I fully moments. expect the next one to be Black Ops One. It's you know, yeah, with maybe. a Roman numeral or whatever. I guess yeah. it, would be, it would be a number for that, wouldn't it? Because right. Roman number numerals originally. Mortal Kombat One is the number one. Yeah, yeah, that's the new reboot thing. The new hotness is just 
ones. <laughs> yeah. Battlefield one was ahead of its time. That was the problem. Yeah. So anyway, the the OCM missions you can choose to play how you want. You can try to go stealth, and you take like a suppressor on your gun, and then it's a lot like Splinter Cell. Like they mentioned, like a lot of it is about shooting out lights and making sure that you're always in the dark and things like that. Mm-hmm. I'll be interested to see how accurate that ultimately is when you actually play the game, or you can choose to go in guns all blazing, and they give you equipment to do that as well like you, you can strap on extra body armor if you want to to give yourself more protection uh, so it does it goes both ways like you can customize your loadout no matter which approach you're trying to take um which i think is smart although i'd agree with you probably the guns blazing approach you don't need the extra armor would be my guess um but then the other thing too is that one thing that they've done is they have finally incorporated kill streaks into the campaign it hasn't worked in the past because you don't really count like how many people you've killed in a row in the campaign. And so they've changed the name of them and they're called, oh, I have it in my notes here somewhere. Um, oh, called armaments. So in the campaign, you get armaments that are like the crazy over the top, pulling the missiles down from the satellite type stuff that you can use in the campaign, which you haven't really been able to use up until this game. So I think that's a pretty cool addition. Um, And then also in the open world missions, there's also vehicles scattered around and they're like, you can jump in a vehicle and just run people over if you want to, which is again, vehicles in the campaigns. Usually you just get in and ride. You don't drive them all that much. As long as you got the war zone stuff happening, you might as well use it. Why not? You have that tech there already, you know? Um, And then the final piece of the puzzle, as with any Call of Duty game, is the zombies mode. Once again, Treyarch is handling zombies for this game, even though they're not the lead developer. Sledgehammer is the lead developer on Modern Warfare 3. Um, Who did the last one? um, Oh, what is the third studio that does Call of Duty? Oh, um, Infinity Ward. Infinity Ward. Yeah. So it wasn't, I mean, I don't know. That's the cycle. Infinity Ward, Sledgehammer, Treyarch. Treyarch. Infinity Ward, Sledgehammer, Treyarch. Yeah. And so Treyarch... Sledgehammer is a weak link in that chain to me. They make pretty good games still, though. Mm. I think they do. But you're right. They're probably the... Well, they're the youngest of the three, for sure. Also, by the way, David Vandahar. Do you recognize that name? No. He has been, like, the head of Call of Duty multiplayer for the last, like, 20 years. He invented the Pick 10 system for your loadouts. He left this week Mm. he left Treyarch after 20 some years something happened there he probably said i've been doing this for 20 years maybe (laughs) but he is the god of call of duty multiplayer like him leaving is a big freaking deal but at the same time you have studios like sledgehammer that have kind of come in and have done a decent job at it and so i don't know i don't know why he left but to me that was a big red flag free high moon studios yeah yeah what happened to them they slave away on as like a support team for these games. Oh, do they? That's what happened to all those Activision studios. They all became support teams for Call of for Duty. For Call of Duty, yeah. Um, the Zombies mode takes place in an open world and mm. is being built by Treyarch, which is great. It's the biggest Call of Duty Zombies map ever. It's called Modern Warfare Zombies MWZ. Whiz. Yeah. It tells a brand new story. And again, it's made oh, Well, by that's what I'm here for. for it's a zombie, zombie story. <laughs> Is, is it a zombie outbreak? Did zombies show up? Is that the story? What the hell? Uh-huh. Well, they do try to have like a premise for each one of these, but it sounds yeah, like... Zombies. Yeah, zombies. Zombies is the premise. It's in the title. Yeah. Guys, what are you doing? Well, it sounds like eventually, or at least in this one, they're going to actually have some form of a plot, which that'll be interesting to see. That's never or not. really worked before. <laughs> um, I liked it better when it was just like JFK mowing down zombies. It's just like... Yeah. Just, be as ridiculous as you want but don't make me sit there and listen to your nonsense it is a little different though it's an extraction shooter this time so you have to go in Mm -hmm. get your stuff and get out alive which i know is kind of the hot new thing i don't really like extraction shooters it feels like it's kind of flagging at this point yeah i mean i i got my extraction shooter fill with the dark zone and division division yeah i don't and i didn't really like it there either doing it (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I wasn't a big fan of it in the the division either. Um, but again, it is an open world game. Uh, the zombies mode is like PVE. It, like if an actual zombie apocalypse happened, I think I'd just be annoyed. Right. I'd just be like, oh, of all the actual apocalypse could happen, it would be the most predictable, boring <laughs> one. Oh, fuck all. Like, just like going around st- stabbing zombies in the head, like just really irritated. I like, would prefer that though, honestly. Couldn't even get aliens. At least aliens. I, I feel like I could manage it and stay alive. Couldn't even zombies. get aliens. We had to get zombies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah but anyway 
that's all the info that we have on Call of Duty Modern Warfare 3. It does come out on November 10th, as you saw in the first uh, clip of gameplay that we showed that was released today. Um, and it is a $70 game, and Call of Duty is going to stay a $70 game. You shouldn't have to ask that anymore. That's just the way it's going to be. They could realistically ask for much more than that, and people would pay it. <laughs> that's the sad truth. Um, but that's what we have so far. Um, Pharaoh Doll says, is there not an option to just start from scratch? They haven't really gone into that yet. Um, where I, I don't think they're going to give you an option though, to like, Hey, say, Hey, you can re unlock all the modern warfare two weapons. Like, mm -hmm. I don't see that happening. It's like either they're going to have them and they're going to be unlocked from the get go, or they're just not going to have them. That'd be my guess anyway. Um, but I am a big COD player and I, I will say this, like last year's call of duty, I did not play it that much. And most of it, honestly, was because of cheating, Matt. Like, I just can't take it. Like, it's it's so easy to see when you play a game. Mm -hmm. It's like you're, like, hunkered down in the corner somewhere looking out a window, and the dude that kills you, you watch the kill cam, dude from, like, 100 yards away knows exactly where you are and runs straight to your ass, runs in the room, knows what corner you're in, and shoots you in the face. It happens all the time and you can see if they have heartbeat sensors or if there's a uav on it you know whether they had something to tell them and there's not there's just cheaters have just overrun call of duty it made me stop playing and so i'll be honest with you unless they can get a handle on it somehow like i don't know if i'm ever going to be really into call of duty again because it's just it's so frustrating mm -hmm. it's like i'm not going to cheat i don't understand why people cheat why what are they getting out of it they're if making you mad but they don't know. I'm not on a mic. They like, know. I mean... I mean, they're, look, they're right. <laughs> but here's the thing, Matt. Most people don't know that uh, the people are cheating. It's mm -hmm. like, so... But they're still mad that they got killed. They're just mad that they get killed. But you don't. After you play Call of Duty for like a week, it doesn't matter. It's just data. It's like, oh, my KD. That's, their, that's, that's what they do, though. I mean, that's always what cheaters... I mean, for as long as... I mean, it's why they call griefers. Like, that's right. the whole thing. They're, they know that someone's going to get mad about it or they're going to be irritated, and that's the point. They are impacting you in a negative way in some form. That's a, all they A lot of people it. have no clue that people are cheating. Like, when mm -hmm. people cheat, so you can click the right stick in the in Modern Warfare 2, and you can report them for cheating. And I do it. I'll report them every time. And as soon as that's on, I turn on my mic, and I'll be like, blah, 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 is cheating. He's using a wall hack. And immediately, half the people in the match are like, oh, you just suck. It's like, mm -hmm. no watch him play and then the guy who's actually cheating will chime in and be like oh he's got murk blah, 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 blah. and then i'll start fr like watching them it, it, they're cheating but most people don't know and so i don't know what people get out of it you're right like if a lot of people use mics like back in the 360 days i get that you know you're a griefer you take joy in the pain of others you like to hear people scream and say that sucks i hate my life blah 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 i don't really get that but i on some level i understand the griefer this, I don't get it. Nobody's on the mics. Every match of Call of Duty is bone silent. They don't care. They know. They, they imagine in their head what people are doing when I they guess. react. That's all. It's frustrating. So anyway, um, I have really fallen off with Call of Duty the la in this, this entry. Like, the one before, the cheating didn't really get bad until it had been out for, like, a few months. That's when, like, they that dongle came out that you can plug into your USB mm. port that everybody uses to cheat. Um, and the, since then, it's just been a disaster. Like, they banned... 15,000 people in one day like a week ago. Huh. That's how bad the cheating is in Call of Duty right now. So to me, like, I, look, I get it. It'll still sell millions of, of copies or whatever, and people will still buy it, and maybe they don't get as frustrated over the cheating as I do, but I just, I don't play it as much as I used to anymore, multiplayer. So anyway, that's a frustrating point of Call of Duty for me, but I'll say this, take cheaters out of the equation, and I think this year's Call of Duty is looking pretty damn good. Like, to have a campaign that is actually trying something new for the first time since, like, Black Ops 2 or the other two games that sold horribly, mm -hmm. <laughs> that, to me, is a big deal. Um, so I am excited to give the campaign a go. I'm not a big Zombies player. They'd have to do something so drastic to get me to really engage with it. Like, I don't know if that'll ever happen. Uh, multiplayer, I kind of prefer. I kind of like unlocking stuff um because again it helps me to uncover weapons that i normally would have never even tried well, i think you're gonna have to try these new weapons to be competitive because clearly the old game's weapons are not gonna be the current it's possible they could nerf those weapons in modern warfare 3 as well to I push you away no from doubt it. they will be yeah it's possible so i guarantee you the new meta for call of duty 3 is going to not going to be use the last game's gun right 
Yeah. Doesn't make any sense. You're probably right. Yep. Um, I'm vaguely interested in the story of the of these three. You know, like the the this remake reimagining of the of the the characters in a, in this similar story but very different story, mm-hmm. but not for the price they charge. Not for yeah. seventy dollars. Not for and like they, and they never go on decent sale. Like, never. Nope. Not for a year. I mean, some of them. I, mean, I have most of the stuff. Most of the, the Call of Duty's up to a point. Because for after a while they go on to, but weirdly the one that never goes on real deep discount sale is ghosts. No, you're right. <laughs> they just want to keep it out of people's hands. Yeah. I mean, it's a black eye for them. Like if you talk to people at Activision or any of the studios that work on Call of Duty, and you bring up ghosts, they try to end the conversation as quickly as possible. They don't even want to talk about it. Mm-hmm. It's like, yep, mistake. Let's move on. Like, it's really bizarre. They know. What exactly was the problem with that one? The campaign was just awful. Mm -hmm. It was just abysmal. Like, the writing was bad. The plot was terrible. The conclusion was bad. I have that. The gunplay felt off, which is like, how did you screw that up? It's called Sledgehammer, right? I think it was, yeah. I think it was, actually. Was there something wrong with the multiplayer? Or is this people didn't like the campaign? It was mostly the campaign. Yeah. Mm hmm. But I don't remember the multiplayer being memorable either. No, I have. I got it for like five bucks on disc at some point to like see how bad it was. I never never bothered to put it in. Yeah. Um, I think I do have every Call of Duty up to Black Ops 4. Okay. Which I will never buy because there's no campaign. Yeah. Um, But I don't think I've played all of them. (laughs) You got them, but you didn't play them. I think the one that really... Because I really didn't like Modern Warfare 3. Yeah. Really didn't. Like it was so clear. Ghost was Infinity Ward. Wow. Yeah. That well, the Infin- Infinity Ward fell off a cliff after the respawn guys left to form a respawn. Um, they, it took them a long time to claw oh, their yeah. way back up to yeah, for any, sure. that level of quality if they ever got there. Yeah. That, that opinions on that vary. I don't know enough to say, but uh, I hated Modern Warfare Three, and I don't don't care about Black Ops. Just Black Ops never did it for me. And then like I would periodically jump in and try once in a while. And Infinite Warfare loved it. Yeah. And then I was like, oh, maybe I'm back on Call of Duty. And then World War II came out, and I hated World War II. World War II yeah. was so boring, yeah. that campaign. I agree. That was I didn't a like it either. Campaign. And then like after that, I was like, I just feel... I, every time I buy those games at full price, I feel burned. Yeah, because all you're going to play is a campaign. Yeah. And, and every, they're never more than, like, four hours long. And every time I I buy them, like, I get them, like, when they're deep discount, I feel like it's too late to mm. care, yeah. you know? Yeah, yep. A couple more things before we move on, though. There are some gameplay tweaks that I forgot to mention. I'm going to go through them very quickly. Uh, there's a new thing called a tactical stance, which is a feature that they're introducing to be a middle ground between hip firing and aiming down the sights. I don't know how that's going to work, honestly. It's something that you can activate on demand. I don't know if it helps you pull the gun up more quickly, but they said it's like if you get caught off guard, you're supposed to activate it and it will help you stay alive. They haven't really explained exactly what it does yet or what it's going to do. Um, so there's a tactical stance. That's new. Um, there's evolving loadouts where you can build your loadout based on cutting edge military equipment, such as gloves and tactical vests and boots. And I don't understand that either. I don't know what that means. Finally, you can play dress up. Yeah. I mean, it is, it's like, okay, cosmetics, but how does that play into actually the power of your loadout is where I'm confused. I don't know. Probably little stat bonuses or something. Maybe. So there's still stuff to uncover in this. And there's also aftermarket. The tech. The, the, the tactical bros are obsessed with the boots and the gloves they and are. stuff, so it makes yeah. sense to do that. Yep. Um, and then there's aftermarket parts, which they're calling the next evolution of Gunsmith. Um, it's a special set of customization op- options that allow you to focus on your preferred and specific play style, and it enables you to construct unique weapon configurations or types, such as customizing a machine gun into a bullpup configuration. You know what that is, right? Yeah, where the, the magazine is in the back. And the handle's and in, the hand in the front. Yeah. yeah. Um, so that's kind of cool. And ideally, say ideally, you can increase your mobility and handling without compromising your damage output. Um, and they also are including uh, slide canceling animations in the game. You can mantle while sprinting, which is a big deal. You don't have to stop running before you mantle. Um, you can also fire right after sliding. Like in the games now, there's like a big delay between sliding and being able to fire your weapon, and they're eliminating that. They're also using the old perk system from the classic Modern War or the classic Call of Duty games, and they've lengthened the time to kill, which that'll cause that'll cause a lot of uproar from mm-hmm. like the people who are really good because right now the time to kill in modern warfare 2 is very low you just get one little burst around your chest you, you're pretty much dead mm-hmm. and that's too extreme in the other direction for me i'd like to find a happy medium there and then the final tweak is they're bringing back the old radar map 
where if you fire your gun, everybody can see where you are. Which they should have never got rid of that anyway. That I'm should have been in the game. They got rid of that at all. I but didn't know. It, Call but of how- Duty is one of those franchises where they've like they've run out of things to do. So they do stuff, they take it away, and then they bring it back like a new feature. In fact, the next game we're about to talk about does the same damn thing. Even more reason to leave it as a platform. Right. Exactly. Yep. So anyway, that's all the information we have on Modern Warfare 3 for now. My guess is from now until November 10th when the game comes out, you're just going to get inundated with media for this game because they still need to blow out zombies they still need to explain some of the ambiguous stuff about multiplayer and they still kind of need to show off the open like campaign missions a little better having watched what they put out today for gamescom that wasn't good enough like Mm -hmm. watching that did you like it's like you said it looks the same no i mean i see like the the attack on the gulag there like i see that it's more of an open Mm -hmm. approach to things but it's very hard to tell how much choice there was in i mean i assume you're stuck repelling down or climbing up at the place that you have to go Mm -hmm. you know like i'm not used to having a lot of agency in in these games so you know be refreshing to get a little bit it would be but i i wasn't a very good demonstration i agree yep so there you go that's our first preview of call of duty modern warfare 3 next up we're going to talk about the game i just mentioned that likes to introduce things Mm take them away, and then bring them back five years later and act like they're all brand new. And that is the Madden franchise. And you may have noticed there are no reviews for Madden out there. None. Mm. There was not a single review of this game before it went on sale. None. And then since that... No one had the QB vision. Okay, exactly. (laughs) Another... That's Mm. actually an option that was introduced, taken away, and brought back. Mm. So... Good. I know things. Yeah, you do know things. Sometimes. Yeah, you definitely do. Um, <laughs> Mostly from hearing you complain about right, it. Right, right. I, yeah. I remember. <laughs> um, so, yeah, there's there's like GameSpot finally put up its review yesterday. IGN still hasn't reviewed Madden. Mm. It's crazy. Like, hardly anyone has. And I'm trying to figure it what out. What is this, Baldur's Gate 3? <laughs> a little bit, yeah. Um, so anyway, it's a little weird that there aren't a lot of opinions out there. Yeah, but I've been playing it for six days and I'm here to do it right now. Um, and as you guys know, I'm a big football guy. I've been playing Madden since I was like eight. Um, and I don't know if I would consider myself a Madden fan anymore. Mm -hmm. I really, for me, how Madden works anymore is like the new one comes out and I play it until the NFL season kicks off and I never play it again. You would think the season kicking off would motivate me to get into it and play more. It doesn't. It's like mm-hmm. Madden is like a surrogate for me until the real thing happens. And then once the real thing happens, I don't care about the video game anymore. It's really bizarre, kind of. Um, but anyway. I mean, given how the game, what the game has become, it kind of makes sense. I guess. Like, it just, uh, much like Call of Duty. They've just become creatively bankrupt. They have they have failed to find new ways every year to introduce something meaningful and fun and worthwhile into Madden. And so they just keep shuffling the, the, the chairs on the deck of the Titanic. And I do feel a little bit like Madden is kind of headed towards an iceberg here. Um, they desperately need to end the exclusivity deal and get some competition. And, I agree. And, and like force EA to either step up or step down. Because my overall impressions of Although Madden, I'm, I am remar- I I've been looking at Madden B roll for many many years at this point. Not that I play it very often, but like, it is remarkable to me that like, they still don't look right when they fall over. Yeah, they, the hits still look weightless because the me. physics aren't right. They they try to say oh field sense real fi- it's not real physics. None it's of still it looks canned. Right. It's still yeah. mocap that's doing all this stuff, man. So my overall impression of Madden twenty four just top line is that. It focuses on all the wrong things. It's a b- beautiful game. It's really stunning. I can't believe they put that collision in their B-roll. I know. Like that's that was their that trailer terrible. right there. Yeah, I know. That doesn't look like two oh. objects touching each other but, at all. Matt, that's nothing. When you start playing the game, you'll realize that that actually looks good compared mm. to a lot of stuff. I did see a TikTok of somebody getting launched from one end zone to the other. Yeah, after they'd score I mean a that's the other thing too. There are bugs all over this game you cannot play this game for more than five minutes without seeing the crazy bug like the the online video clip stuff for this is like on the level of like fifa like with the bugs like there's it's, it's <laughs> i've i've never seen it quite so prominent from madden there's a shot at the beginning of every single game where they show like the team getting ready 
And then behind them, you can see like the people on the sidelines. And there's a wait, maybe right here. No, there's a guy who's supposed to be holding a camera for the TV crew. Uh, there he is. Right there he is. Look on the left with the blue thing. Oh, he doesn't have a camera. He has no camera. <laughs> and it is in ev the open to every game. It's in every every open to every game. You he, see the dude standing there with no he just camera. He's just, he's just some guy who wants to be part of the part of the thing. He's, <laughs> he's just like, I'm imagining his camera. <laughs> There's Coach T, by the way. Um, so anyway, there are literally, if you play this game for five <laughs> minutes... You're gonna find a. You're gonna see a bug, and some of them are insane. Like I haven't seen yet, like the ant-sized players or anything extreme like that. But like in some of the other modes where there are like cinematics, like there was one time where there was a character in one of the cinematics that literally was wearing a mask, like it covered his whole head, mm. and then it had like the flap that's supposed to go under the shirt, like that goes down over the body, but you could see the whole thing. Like there's just crap all through this game like that, but. If you just watch like the B-roll or you just watch, it looks gorgeous. Like my wife was watching it. She's like, oh my God, I can't believe how far video games have come. Like this is one of those games that she, cause she understands football. She knows football. She's a big Steeler fan, just like me. She watches this and is like, I really can't tell that it's like not real. Like it, it's like I'm watching a football game. I feel like that when I watch some of that NBA 2K footage. Yeah, too. it's also like, some there. of that is ridiculous. It's really crazy how realistic they've got. But the problem is, is that's what they focus on instead of getting the game to play right. It drives me freaking yeah. bonkers. So and it, and it breaks down when you look at the individual players interacting with it, like from a bird's eye, like watching yeah. the whole play happen. It does look very convincing. Yeah. But when like you see those little interactions between the different player models, it's just like oh. Well, one thing that they added... It honestly doesn't look much better than the PS3 sometimes. Yeah. Well, one thing that they added to this year's game is the interactions between players after plays are way more elaborate. Mm -hmm. So it used to be they would just, like, walk through each other. Oh, yeah, they just stand it's up like straight. It's like they weren't like, even there. Away. Yeah, like... Now, they do bump into each other, and but they fight. Like, after <laughs> every play, the players start pushing each other like they're going to fight each other. It's bizarre. It's like, okay, we finally got this thing to work, and now we're just going to abuse the living hell out of it so that everybody yeah. hates it. One of the... One of the things that I always always struck me about football, American football, is like you'd think these guys would fight way more often than they right. do, but they don't. Like yeah. it's super, super rare. Eric Cartman it says eight and nine season for the Steelers. I will bet you any amount of money that you want to bet that they'll win more than eight games this year. Literally any amount that you want to bet, Eric Cartman is. Put your put your money where your mouth is. I will bet you any amount of money they win at least nine games. Right now, in the chat. Let's do it. <laughs> Because you're going to owe me a ton of money, dude, when it's all said and done. Um, so anyway, as I said, features that go away and then come back for this year's game, it's mini games, which they call training camp, and the superstar mode. And the superstar mode, Matt, is there to replace the abysmal story modes from the last few games. Remember, they're called Long Shot and Face of the Franchise. Yeah, yeah. They were just terrible. Like they had. It's been. It came. A, came a long way down from having Mahershala Ali in. Uh, yeah. In that first one. Well, then they then they also had like the writers from TV shows like working on it or whatever, and like I, they it was awful. So they Eric, replaced. Eric Cartman is is in. Are you in? Fifty bucks. You done. I'll go higher if you want to go higher. Any amount of money you want to bet, I'll bet it that they'll win nine games. Let's see if he budges above fifty. We'll see. AJ the Legend says, see you at SoFi, Shango Rams. <laughs> Steelers are going to beat the Rams at SoFi, too, <laughs> by the way. <laughs> so anyway, um, the mode that went away and then came back, mini games, they call, they've relabeled it as training camp. And then the superstar mode is there to replace the abysmal story mode from the last couple games. But the, it's still kind of the same thing. Like, you still start out as this, like, young college player. You go through, like, the combine. You, like, do interviews with the press. And you, like, try to increase your, your uh, draft stock or whatever. Then you get drafted by a team. And then you try to become a star. It's basically the same damn thing. They just named it something different. And it's still terrible. The writing, the graphics, the facial animation, the an everything about it is terrible. I don't understand why I can't get it right, Matt. I, I'll be honest with you. I would prefer a story mode in Madden if they even wanted to make the players look like chibi, like a JRPG or whatever. Like anything is better than what they're doing with this. Like there are football games that have done this. There's a football game from Japan of all places mm -hmm. called Eye Shield 21. It's based on a manga, I believe. Yep. 
And it's great. Japan has been doing story-driven sports games for many, many years. It's amazing. Like, play them, Tiburon. Go play these other games. Go play Golf Story. You can do a great sports RPG. You could do Golf Story with a lot of the NFL players with how much golf they play. Right. Like, Like, that could be the most. Seriously, (laughs) it would be better than Superstar Mode. It's, I don't understand what EA is doing. Look, they are... On the that would annual. be pretty funny. Like your story mode in Madden is just a bunch of the players go play golf together and it yeah. turns into a whole dramatic thing. That would be great. Now they are on the annual squirrel wheel. They do have to make this game yeah. every year and that hurts, but they got to, maybe they need to stop doing that. Maybe this needs to become a platform. Like mm-hmm. you're talking about with call of duty. It needs it in the worst way. Um, so there's also inside superstar mode. There's a bunch of different options and there's another one called superstar showdown. And that has replaced what was what has the last couple of years been called the yard, which is like an NFL blitz style three versus three like arcade style mode. And the only thing they did to change it to give it a new title was that they put it all inside in like a warehouse. It's like so weird. It's like, what are you doing? It's like I play it like twice and I'm like, I'm good. I don't need to play this anymore. Um it's, and it's weird, too. You you have the yard in the game for all these years. You build the brand, the yard. Like, you could almost at that point spin it off as the new NFL Blitz. Like, it's its own game. But instead of doing that, you take you ditch the name, give it a new name, and make it worse. I What is going on? It's like, I guess the best way I could describe it is like, it's like a football game for Gen Z that Gen Z never asked for. Hmm. Like, the three-on-three mode. It's really bizarre. Um, the one cool thing, though, I will say is if you use your superstar character in any of those modes, he does level up. So if you go back to the actual superstar story mode after playing the other modes, your your player is better and improves, so he can then do better in the superstar mode. That is one thing that I did like about it. But honestly, after sitting through all the modes in this, franchise is still the mode, I think, for serious players to play. And it's like you use the real players, and you go through years and seasons, and there's just there's literally already... Two million franchise leagues online to join. Two million. This game's only been out for like four days. And there's two million leagues already to join if you want to join. Or you can start your own. Or you can just play by yourself. Um, And they did make some tweaks to the franchise mode. Um, They made trades better. Like you can add more players into trades. You can renegotiate contracts now. Um, Re... uh, franchise relocation works a lot better now in fact most years that was kind of busted they fixed all that um so there, i have there are some changes to franchise that i've noticed but again i've only played this for five days you really notice the differences when you've played you're going for like your fourth season of franchise that's when the modes start to pile on now i did play a whole season to see what happened when the season turned over because that's an important part of any sports game is like okay you're playing franchise you made it through the season what happens the next season when you contracts expire and players retire like that's where the rubber hits the road for franchise mode and i was pretty impressed with franchise mode in madden 24 as long as the features are concerned um but then the mode that most people play and i'll never understand it is madden ultimate team and that's basically the trading card option it's also where ea makes all its money um and i honestly could not find a single change to ultimate team not one matt Hmm. not even tweaks and it may be a case of where ea is like it ain't broke it's making like 240 million dollars a quarter for us don't mess with it i don't know but it's so laggy like honestly this whole game matt it's like Honestly, it's like using my PC to play like modern games. <laughs> like all the menus take forever and lag. Like it's never snappy. You select something and there's a, such a delay that by the time it actually activates, you've hit another button and it like takes you out of it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like well, that, that conversation you had with that guy, like you were both jerking around like like you were trying to run it on an old voodoo card or something. Yeah, it's- this is the superstar mode that I was talking about. So this is the combine where you go and run the 40, you do bench presses, you do the long jump, all that kind of stuff. And then you get graded on it. And then that deter- basically determines like where you get drafted. Like I ended up getting drafted like 17th overall or whatever after I finished the combine. And then after you do that, then you do like interviews with the press to make sure that you're media trained. You go through like the whole process basically. <laughs> all right, calm yeah. down. <laughs> um what else so ultimate team it's the same damn deal um there as usual there's slimy monetization going on some of the higher powered cards have limited availability so you want to buy them because if they're only going to give you a thousand cards 
trying to earn that card, it's never going to happen because you're counting on it randomly showing up in a deck that you get. So people just buy them. So if they put out a really power, high-powered card, they're like, oh, we're only making 1,000 of them. They, all 1,000 are just bought. They're just purchased. And if you're also not engaged with Ultimate Team 24-7, you miss it altogether. And you come back in, you're like, oh, crap. Where'd that card come from? Oh, you took two days where you didn't play the game. Now you're screwed. Like, yeah, the, I am very, very over the artificial scarcity thing for any kind of like, ongoing product collectible thing I guess going on in the in the card game world now with that Disney Lorcana thing. Yep. Where like they didn't make enough. They literally didn't make. Uh, this is Disney. This is Disney and Ravensburger. They yep. could definitely have made enough to meet demand. And because of that, because you've got a perfect storm of all that shit. There are cards from that set going for $1,600 right now. Jeez. But you can't go just buy a pack because they're all super limited and nobody got the stock. Right. And it's like, that's artificial. Like, you could just flood it. You just make as much as anybody wants for this. Same thing, with, like, especially with digital. There's no there's, there's no rare digital items. You can't, That's not a thing. Yeah, it's not you a thing. You create that. It's like that's, NFTs. It's yeah. the same damn thing. Yeah. Um, you can see there's cameos in mm -hmm. Superstar mode. There was Dion. Yeah. Um, in there he's like your basically your mentor who tries to get you through the draft and stuff like that and then as you play in the superstar you level up you can go and you can att attribute points to your player um, my player's a quarterback so obviously most of the stats i put into his throwing abilities or whatever so it is a like a little bit of a mini rpg um but the story is so damn bad and embarrassing that it's like there's very little motivation to keep playing honestly it's weird how nobody's managed to like really match the road to the show no you're right yeah it's still the best. Yeah. Yeah. There's not a thing you get to say about a baseball game. Yeah, I mean, there's some stuff in NBA 2K that they've done a pretty good job on, and mm -hmm. I wouldn't mind seeing Madden emulate some of the stuff that NBA 2K has done as far as, like, the single-player modes. Obviously, the monetization, I hope they stay away from, but but some of the ideas that are in NBA 2K, I do think Madden could take some notes from. Um, also, there's cross-play and cross-progression included for the first time ever in Madden. But neither is really like a glaring need. Like, I've never had problems getting a game in Madden, ever. You could even go play a Madden game that's like three years old and go online. As long as the internet, the online's up. Yeah. You won't have to sit more than like 10 also, seconds how many before people you have match multiple, up. multiple versions of Madden across a platform in the same year. Again, like, it's, you don't need it. Like, you don't need either one of those things for Madden. Cross play. Or cross progression. I do get there are some people that are crazy Madden psychos that will maybe play it on multiple I, platforms, but the, those things aren't real, right? This is the so this is the mini games. Okay, but this is one but of the in new real things life. They, they don't have the like drone obstacles that spin back and forth across the. No, that's field, not right? real. Okay. That that is all just for this. And these are this is the mini games mode where you just basically go and play these little and they're they're so easy. And most of them last literally less than 30 seconds. And then you have to sit to go to the next mini game for like 30 seconds waiting for the next mini game to load. Again, this whole game is just so laggy. Like this platform that they've built Madden on, they need to redo it. What is it? Is I, it Frostbite? It's, it's Frostbite, yeah. Of course it's Frostbite. Yeah. Frostbite always feels like you're underwater. It's just slow. Like it just takes, and I'm playing this on PS5 with my SSD and the load times are excruciating. People can whine all they want about Ubisoft, but like, at least I don't have to worry about that with Outlaws. That's true. You know? That's true. Like forcing all that weird stuff on it. EA, yeah. that is one of the dumbest things EA ever did. Yep. Um, some other stuff that they supposedly worked on or added, they said that they did a, a lot of work on the blocking with this new tactical blocking system. It's a disaster. So I, I can't tell you how many times I ran a sweep left or a sweep right. I got out there, and one of my teammates is standing in front of me. He's supposed to run in front of me and block, and he just stands there. He doesn't go forward to block at all. I, the, I thought it was terrible. One thing I did notice a difference in with the like the moment-to-moment -moment gameplay in this is momentum is a bigger deal. So once your player gets going, like gets up to a certain speed, they're way harder to tackle in this. And you can see it. It's obvious. Like they'll grab at you and you'll slip out of their grasp a lot of times. And that is something that has never happened in a Madden game. And so that to me is one little step forward that I have seen a difference in. Like, for example, obviously I'm a Steelers fan. Their running back is Najee Harris. He's a big bruiser. Like his thighs are just like gigantic. It takes him a while to get up to speed. Once he gets up to speed in this game, like he gets to like the eight or 10 yard mark, good luck bringing him down. 
And that's the way it should be because he's big. He's built a bunch of iner inertia. It's science. But in the past, this game hasn't used science. It's just used pre-canned mo capped animations. And then it's trying to do calculations on the fly. This guy came from this direction at this speed. And this guy came from this. So, so this should happen. This canned animation should happen. That's how Madden used to be. Mm -hmm. And a lot of this game is still that way, honestly. But I did feel a difference in the player momentum making a difference on whether they could break tackles or not. So at least there's one step in the right direction. Um, field sense returns along with the skill-based passing system from last year. But again, like neither one of them, I really could, couldn't notice any tweaks or changes other, other than the, the running momentum, as I mentioned a minute ago. Um, the game is cut together like a real NFL game as far as like, okay, we cut from this shot to this shot and there's a transition in between. Like it has an NFL, a professional NFL broadcast presentation to it, but it's also broken. So if you're like me and you're editing this footage in an editing program, and a lot of times you're going frame by frame, there are frames in the transitions, Matt, of just random crap. <laughs> <laughs> like a shot of the sideline, a shot of the stadium, just like two frames of it, just out of nowhere. And you won't mm. notice it if you're watching the game live because it just happens so fast. But when you're editing in an editing program, you see the frames. You're like, oh, my God, there's just these random frames of random crap in the presentation. It's I really think a big bulk of the problem in this game is just the yearly schedule. You're just asking too much in 2023. Look, doing this back in the PS2 era or the PlayStation 1 era, okay. There's only so much you could do with those platforms. Now you're asking so much. The players are asking so much from these games that realistically asking Tiburon, look at that. See that bug? Oh. Yeah. <laughs> just stuff like this happens all the time. Look, you just start spinning around there for like <laughs> no reason. He gets cream from behind. That's very funny. But this stuff just happens all the time in this game where players get in the T pose or they just do, look at, watch him. Spin, spin. <laughs> what the heck? Again, I really think the yearly schedule is crushing this franchise. And I know its sales are fine and it's one of the best selling games every year. But I'm telling you, if this game were go really good, they would sell more. And I believe it. And if they wanted to do it every two years and just do like a download update on the off year that you charge like 25 bucks for or whatever, I think people would be cool with that. If they knew that eventually the platform, the base platform, was going to get to a good place. But... At this point, I've almost given up hope on this franchise, Matt. And I think as long as it's an annual game, I think it's going to stay that way. I just do. As long as it's an annual game, as long as it's exclusive. Yeah. Players do. I would love to see NBA. I'm sure the season passes would be egregious, but I'd love to see like 2K get a shot at, at NFL again. Me too. I agree a million percent. Like I said, or one thing too, the players do look better. They're more individualized. There aren't as many templates. Um, for example, you'll see here in a second, Patrick Mahomes. He has this very distinctive flat flak jacket that he wears under his jersey at all times and it makes him look a little boxy and weird looks exactly like that in this like they have done a better job of making players look like themselves as far as their build how they their gait how they run their faces look way better this time again focusing on the visuals instead of the stuff that really matters like where the rubber hits the road with the gameplay well except by that point you've already paid them the money so they right. don't care yeah that's true commentary incredible it still has like a moments here and there where they're like, we'll say things that don't make perfect sense or whatever. But some of the stuff that they do say in this is insane. So somehow they managed to get the draft analysis for every team into this game, every team. And they reference it throughout the game. They drafted this guy to replace this guy. Oh, this guy's hurt. This guy that they just drafted is going to come in. It's pretty amazing because the draft just happened like a month ago. To get that all into the game for every team, that's pretty impressive. So I was pretty impressed mm -hmm. with that. One also, of, although one of the things that has you know upgraded a lot of like you know fast like VA stuff like that is because of the pandemic, everybody can record stuff at home mm -hmm. professionally now. Yeah. So like that's true. That is you have an option to do that really quickly now. It's true. Yep. Um, they also make lots of references to like the portion of the season that you're in. So they're like, oh, it's early in the season. They have time to get that sorted out. You get late in the season, like they're running out of time. They really need to get this defense. But like it, the commentary in this is great. Now, again, 
Don't get me wrong, they still do make mistakes. Like every once in a while you still get a comment that has nothing to do with what happened or is contextually out of place. So it's not perfect, but it's pretty damn good. I was pretty impressed by the commentary on this. Um, but again, ultimately, this is just another Madden where, as I said earlier, they're just reshuffling the deck chairs on the Titanic. They're t they take away stuff, they bring back stuff that you had before that you may or may not have liked. Um, I really wish the Tiburon team would start looking at other sports games. Like I said, I Shield 21, Rollerdrome, that inline skating game that I played a few months ago that has an awesome story mode. That It's a sports game, but it has a great story in it. Like, they need to start looking at some of these smaller games for inspiration for their big game. Um, but yeah, I would not buy this. I just wouldn't. I would go buy last year's Madden game. It's been patched up. A lot of the bugs have been tapped out of it. The other thing too is like I played a bunch of games online and oh my God. Either you get the guy who every play, he runs the clock all the way down. And I believe people do this to make you quit so that they get the win. Like every play... They wait until the play clock is at zero before they hike the ball. And it makes like a five-minute quarter game last like an hour. I ran into, I don't know how many people doing that. The other thing too is that, and this is just a problem that's been with Madden for forever, the games take forever. <laughs> Even if you play a five-minute quarter, it's like 35 or 40 minutes to play a single game. Like it's a big I mean, commitment. That's, a, that's accurate. And so what I've found a lot, like, is if, if I play in a game and like I'm down by like 15 points in the second half, I just concede. I'm like, I'm not going to sit here for the next like 25 minutes hoping I can forge a comeback. Like it discourages me from sticking with the games a lot of times. And I will say this, they did add better conceding options in the game this year so that you can concede um, without it being as ugly. Like in the past, it's like, oh, you're quitting. You're, you're going to get penalized. Now it can just be like, okay, you're willing to concede this game. And if your opponent is cool with it, you can just give up basically. And you do get the loss, but you don't get the penalty for just dropping the game, so to speak. So, and then again, there's just so many visual bugs and issues in the game. Like I just really struggle. I would really struggle to tell anybody, no matter how big of a football fan or a Madden fan they are to buy this year's game. Um, I would go buy last year's game for 10 bucks it's all patched up. They've already patched out all the money plays. Because that's the other thing, too, I found is, like, half of the people I played online use the San Francisco 49ers because it had, they have Christian McCaffrey. And he is the fastest guy in the game. Even so, one thing you can do in this game that I like that is an addition is before each game starts, you can set the general philosophy of your team on offense and defense. So you can set, like, on offense, I want to concentrate on passing medium or passing short or running inside or running outside. On defense, you can say, I want to stop the inside run. I want to stop the outside run. Every time I go to play the 49ers, I set my defense up to stop the outside run, and it does not matter. I know Christian McCaffrey's going to run a sweep. You can't stop it. He's too fast. And so half of the people I played use the 49ers and just use McCaffrey what a every play. Weird animation. Right. That animation too. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> yep. I put that in there on purpose so mm. people could see that the animation, because I'm ba trying to back up the stuff I'm talking about here in the B roll. And I do. Almost everything I talk about, you will see in this B roll. So, yeah, to me, Madden's a dud this year. It looks good. Like, don't be fooled <laughs> by, the, by how pretty it looks. Um, it does not play very well, honestly. Um, and so I didn't have much fun playing this at all over the last like four or five days. I just found myself aggravated and annoyed by it more than anything else. Um, I don't know. Maybe some other people had different experiences than me, but um, Eric Carmetta says I do that to control the clock running the ball. Of course. Yeah, no crap, dude. You're playing five minute quarters. You can basically have one drive and eat up the whole quarter. That's not fun. Like, if you're, it sucks. Like, I get it. I know why people do it. They're trying to win. But I think mostly they're trying to get you to get so bored that you quit. And that's what I do. It works. <laughs> like, when I play those people that run the clock all the way down before they hike the ball every time, I quit. Like, I'll get to halftime. Like, in fact, the last couple games I played, I didn't even finish the first quarter. I was even winning one game and I quit. <laughs> Because I'm like, I, this isn't fun. I don't want to spend an hour and 10 minutes playing one game of Madden. Like, do you care about winning that much that you're going to zap all the fun out of playing the game? I don't get some people, Matt, as you can't tell. I don't mm. get the cheaters. And I don't get the people who try to force you to quit in Madden so they can get a win. It's like, do people play games for fun anymore, Matt? I mean, or am I the only one left? 
I mean, that's that's the mentality, though, isn't it? It's, it's like win. That's the point, is win. I mean, I'm really competitive. You know that. Mm-hmm. Everybody knows that. I'm not psycho like that. I'm not going to sit there. And yeah, like, but you've also competed and won in actual real life shit. I and guess. A lot of the people doing this do not and cannot. I don't know. That's, that's my theory. It's the only reason I can understand people getting so mad about losing a game of Street Fighter that they start sending racial slurs to you. Yeah. Emperor Dread brings up a good point in chat, though. He says it sounds like they need a button, which is play confirmed, hike it one second, and skips right to it. That would be great. Mm-hmm. That would be great. Because what how it starts, Matt, is the player on offense... The play doesn't start until they make their play. So you can tell they're going to do this because they they wait for inexperienced players to pick the defense first. And then they can see what defense you select, and then they'll choose their play that will burn your defense. But I don't do that. I'm a vet, I'm a mad, mad and veteran. So I know this old tactic. So I sit there, and I wait. And they will wait to call their play until there's five seconds left on the play clock, which leaves me scrambling trying to choose my play. And they get up to the line of scrimmage, and they hike it immediately. So I don't even know if that option would work, because that's not what most of these people do. Because people have figured it out like me, and you sit there, and you wait for them to call their play before you call your defensive play. And by that time, the time on the clock is right. It just makes it shitty. Like, it's not worth it. Like, get a life. I hate to, I hate to use that phrase because it's like dumb or what, but get a life. It's pathetic. And it ruins my time with Madden, and I'm sure it ruins a lot of people's time with Madden. I mean, I'm way beyond you on that one. I've been out of multiplayer gaming forever because of that shit. It's, like, I don't care anymore. I, it's no one... No one's there to play and have fun. They're playing to like game the system and uh, to rack those numbers up. And it's just like I don't, I don't give a shit. Yeah, so, I don't yeah. care enough. I guess is what the problem is. I don't know. Sort of, but it's like if that's if you find the game fun, but the way you play to win is not fun, then that's not going to work for you, is it? Like yeah. that's that's how a lot of stuff is. He's like sort of like. Yeah, so why I didn't find Assassin's Creed interesting after a while multiplayer because pe- the people found these strategies that were all and always the strategies break how the game is meant to be played in good faith. Mm-hmm. You know, that's the problem. Yeah. Is like there like, is no good faith. Yeah. That's the problem. Yeah, no one would no one would do that. And uh, mathematically, it doesn't work, kind of yeah. thing, right? Um, it's you know, there's some people that I think you know, you see people raging about Street Fighter stuff online. It's like, yeah, well, you're if you think doing a combo ruins the game. This may not be the genre for you, right? You know, like you got to yeah. know, and yeah. it's it's just yeah, it, it, it's it's a thing. Online play uh, has that element of like the we're, we're here to win, and we don't care how shitty we make the game in the process. And there are genres that where that ruins it for me. And there's you know fighting. Well, there games are games that keep that from happening by the way they're made. Like yeah. <laughs> but, I don't know. And there are but, a lot that don't. <laughs> yeah, uh, sports games seem to have trouble with that. Yeah, Arabis says, uh, "Why isn't the play clock set to like thirty seconds for both players?" It is. It is. But but thirty seconds is an eternity when you're staring, when you're at, the staring at a static screen. What you're missing is like you go to the play screen and you sit and wait for the other player who's on offense to call his play. And once he does that, the formation that he calls pops up on the screen. So it'll tell you he has. Um, two running backs, two tight ends, and two wide receivers. That's a run play. Nine times out of ten, that's going to be a run play. So you'll call a run defense. What they do is they sit there, and they won't call the play until the play clock is clocked down to five seconds left. So you're sitting there staring at a blank play call screen for 30 seconds. Every play. Can you not understand why that is annoying as fuck? Like, it sucks. He didn't say AF. That's how you know No, that's really how you mad. know I'm fired up. <laughs> So anyway, so, so that, and that doesn't happen in real life because you have to actually move human beings in a certain amount of time. No, you want to a rhythm it. to your team. Like yeah. no offense, like calls you a play want- and then goes to the line of scrimmage and makes their guys break down for 30 seconds in a stance. They'll be dog <laughs> tired by the time the play out. It's completely unrealistic. Mm-hmm. Like the other thing too, is when you're on offense in the real NFL, you want rhythm. Like I played quarterback when I played football. The coach was like, get them in and out of the huddle and get them to the line of scrimmage. You want a rhythm with your team. Like, it's mm-hmm. a physical, like, almost a, like a biomechanical thing with, with human beings. Like, you get them in the routine. Get them into the huddle, out of the huddle, break the huddle, hush, rush them up to the line of scrimmage, and don't screw around. Because it's a rhythm. They get they get down in their stance. If you make them stay in that stance, they get tired. Their legs so, get tired. So is that the solution to add a thing where, like, if you do that too long, the players perform worse? Actually, yes, that would be a good idea. That would be the more realistic way to handle it. And to make sure that you market it so people know that it's in there. 
Mm-hmm. Although, it would be great if they didn't know either, because then you'd have an advantage. But anyway, be for the purposes of a level playing field, you should message that and make sure people know that that's a feature. So there are ways to fix it if they decide to. Um, but again, it's like... If you're a game developer, do you, you just have to assume that people are shitty? Yes. <laughs> I guess you kind of do. I think most game, that's devel- where we're at. most game developers will tell you that is absolutely true. I that's think. terrible. But you're right. I think that's Maybe where we're doing at. multiplayer games. So, yeah. 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 So anyway, that's Madden NFL 24. I say stay far away from that game. I did not have hardly any fun playing it, and I stuck with it. I played through all the modes. I played a full season of, season of franchise. I played, I don't know, 25 online games. I gave it the, the run through and I found so many problems and I can't even imagine if I stuck with it. I actually saw a review yesterday from Madden where they they tried. It was like total like Super Bowl Nation, like sports, like website, like review of Madden where obviously like it, it appeared that there was a little bit of payola going on there. And he tried to like say that the bugs in the game made it more realistic because real human beings make mistakes. It's like, I think wow. A, I think there's a difference between that and like <laughs> flying from one end of the field to the other. Anyway. Yep. So anyway, that's Madden NFL 24. I say it's far away. You can get Madden NFL 23 for 10 or 15 bucks. Go buy it. Download the updates. Download the updated rosters, which will be there for you. And enjoy a game that isn't busted. Next up. And our last topic for today's show is a smaller game that I played this week called Stray Gods. And Matt, I will tell you. I did not know what I was getting myself into when I started playing this mm. game. I thought it was a music and rhythm game where you were in a band and trying to make your band successful. And I thought it was like a music and rhythm RPG where you're in the band and like you have to go and perform and you do the music and rhythm stuff while you perform. And then in between performances, there's all this drama going on with the band. Like I thought that's what it was. As it turns out, no, it is actually... A video game musical. Mm-hmm. And Matt, if there's one thing you know about me, what is it? You don't like Madden this year. But also, you don't like music. Yes. <laughs> In fact, I hate musicals. And this game hides it a little bit at first. Like, at first it so does. we had to wait for him to leave before we did the x Play musical episode. <laughs> right, yeah. Which was amazing, by the way. The only musical I've ever liked, if I, <laughs> if I could say that. Um they hide it at first. At first, it does just seem like a choose-your-own-adventure like adventure game, and then the first, then it breaks out into the song. And I have that same moment when I'm watching musicals where they start singing, and I'm like, just talk to each other. But this game is different, and I hate musicals, but I have actually enjoyed playing this game, if you can believe it. Um, so it is a—they they are— um, marketing this as a musical rpg and it is to an extent but i think that does maybe oversell it a little bit the game is created and written by former dragon age writer david gator um he started his own little studio just to make this game this was his idea that he had kicking around for a long time obviously that was never going to happen where he was working at bioware so he left although maybe dragon age the musical isn't a terrible idea at this point. <laughs> maybe um So anyway, this is his game. This is his baby. Um, And basically how it works is it is a musical. And there you're seeing in the B-roll here, there's it's it's a lot of talking and voiceover and conversation and making decisions in those conversations. But where the rubber really hits the road with this game is in the middle of the songs. So the songs start. I groan (laughs) like, oh, God, here we go. But what happens is you get to certain to certain points of the songs and they ask you to make a decision about the song, about which direction the song's going to go. So how these songs work is like one character will sing and then the other character, they take turns kind of going back and forth. And what happens is when the other character is about to wrap up their part, you make the decision on what part your character is going to sing next. And it changes everything. It changes the story. It changes the song on the fly. Like your choice that you make, that next verse of the song, you're singing the words related to the choice that you made. And then things happen based upon that. Like it affects the next question that you get. It affects the other character in the conversation, what they're going to ask you next, how they're going to react to you. It is this fully adaptive and reactive, interactive musical. It's, I've never seen anything like it. So to start the game, you do choose 
your personality here is your trait or whatever so there's three different things that you can choose from I mean, this is the same as dragon age 2 yeah i mean it is he i think he obviously brought this over from yeah. from the, that game and basically what happens is when you whatever um disposition that you choose here in this menu affects the rest of the game so options in the songs will be grayed out depending on what traits you decide on because it's basically you're, picking, you're not rolling dice right you're basically picking your personality here and then inside the game when you make the decisions in the songs they're forcing you to adhere to that personality that you chose so there are repercussions on down the road for what you do right here on the screen that reverberates all the way through the rest of the game and i would argue this alone makes it playing again because it does drastically change almost every part of the game um you and i like too that it shows you what it's taking away from you so you know oh that's what i would have chosen Maybe next time I want to play it through the different way with a different personality trait, and maybe I'll be able to choose what I want to when I play through these songs in my second playthrough. So it does incentivize at least a little bit for you to give the game another go. Um, so what do you think of the art in this, in the graphics and everything? I like the the art design, but I don't like the animation. Me either. Like, yeah. I don't like the, the keyframe dissolve animation yep. thing. I didn't like it in what's it what that oh, adventure game thing that, for that xbox exclusive yeah. where they robbed the bank and yeah. ah what is I, his name you asked me too quickly uh, as dusk falls yeah as that? dusk falls yeah yeah i didn't like it in that i don't like, I like it, in it this. better in that than this though i'll say that much um i find it easier to accept in this as a, like a hand-drawn thing as opposed to like especially with because like, there's no 3d objects moving at 60 frames yeah. per second <laughs> in the universe there yeah um but it's not i mean obviously it's a budget thing clearly but like it's not great uh, I do like the drawings. I got like the, the the actual art is good. I just I, I don't like that animation style, and it comes from a childhood trauma from the uh, um, uh, uh, the Great Bear Scare special that was. Uh, if you look that up online, it was uh, it was based on a book I liked about a bear, and there's like monsters show up and bear town or some shit but like <laughs> basically they ran out of funds and so all they could they, they had keyframes done but didn't could didn't have money to, to do in betweening so what the way they did was they just sort of dissolved from keyframe to keyframe and it's one of the most uncomfortable things i've ever <laughs> seen like i i was i was like it was the first time i think might be maybe the first time in my life i was looking forward to something and really got disappointed by it i'm like what the hell is it so i hate that style of animation yeah like just well um, they do close up sometimes and it pixelates the art so instead of them redrawing ah. it zoomed in, they just literally zoom in on the art and it mm. pixelates it and it looks terrible. But anyway, people watching this bureau have got to be like, what in the living hell is going on in this game? Because while you were talking, crazy stuff was happening. And well, it, it looks to me like you are one of the muses. Yes, you are the muse. So mm. what happens is... Well, there the, are nine muses. Yeah. I'm actually going to rewind this bureau just a little bit here. So but basically what happens is you are in a band and you are having auditions. This girl shows up to your auditions and she's amazing. But she doesn't want to join the band or whatever. You go home, she knocks on your door and shows up and she's dying. She's bleeding or whatever. And she dies, like right and on. She, and she turns out to be a muse. She is, the, she is the muse, yeah. Calliope or whatever her name is. Calliope is one of the nine muses in Greek mythology. Yep. That's that, and that's her. And so she dies and now you take her place. The mm. problem is you meet with all these other Greek gods. And these are this like Apollo and Aphrodite's on the mm. right. Um Persephone is all the way on the left. Persephone. Persephone. Yeah, I always pronounce it incorrectly. Um, so anyway, these they are pronounce all... all the letters in the ancient Greek stuff for some reason. Yeah. It's like that, those E's want to be known. Yeah. So basically, it's the Greek pantheon of gods. They believe that you have killed her. They don't mm. believe you that she showed up at your door dead. And at first, they're going to kill you for killing her. You convince them, well, through conversation options like you're seeing right now, you can convince them to let you live. And I, my guess is probably all roads lead to this. And they give you a week to prove your innocence. And then the game flips and it becomes a detective game where you have to figure out who killed her in a week. Otherwise, they're going to kill you. And mm -hmm. Apollo ends up he, that he was in love with her. And so he ends up joining your side and, and ends up helping you in your investigation. But it's this uh, very... Is that Athena then? Yes. The yeah, it's Athena. at the desk with her owl. Yep. Yeah. And it's just... <sighs> Very Neil Gaiman. Yeah. I mean, this, I've never played a game like this in so many ways. It is completely different from pretty much anything else. So you saw in the I mean, one scene. There's shades of, of Hades here in, a terms little of, bit. in terms of like the art premise. Yeah. 
a little art, bit. art a little bit like just how they're using the gods and how they're yep. modern modernized idea ideas of them yep um so you are a god you are the muse you and you take it over but you and a part of the game too is discovering what your powers are and what you eventually discover is that like you need to convince people to break out into song because song is how you manipulate them to get the information that you need. So you have discussions with somebody. You need to angle those discussions in such a way that a song will start. And then once the song starts, then you get those options mid song where you can guide the conversation. Um, so this is Pan. Pan, yeah. So Pan shows up. He also wants to help you, but he's also slimy. He has information that he can give you to help your investigation, but he says that he's going to need something later on down the road. That I'm not going to yeah, spoil what that is. Um, probably sex. <laughs> maybe. Um, but I believe she's gay. If mm -hmm. I, I haven't been able to tell that 100%, but God, I think that's Gods go all different directions, right. though, so who knows? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Especially Pan. Yeah. I mean, for God's name, his got to say his name is Pan. Right. <laughs> Touche. Um, so anyway, Pan shows up. He's like, I'm willing to help you for a price. He doesn't tell you exactly what the price is, but you take his help anyway because you have a week wearing to figure Prince's, this all out before you die. Wearing Prince's glasses, clearly. Yeah. <laughs> um, purple. And the voice acting in this is good. Like, they've hired some, like, top-shelf talent yeah, for this. I know, the, I know Troy and Ashley are in this. And, well, Laura Bailey is Grace, who's yeah. the lead character, the girl with the dark hair. And then, you're right, Troy Baker and Felicia Day play Apollo and Athena. The whole cast is just littered with big-budget well, voice actors. I mean, he can. Dave can get the, the big people after, yep. after all the Bioware stuff, for sure. Yeah. And so the, the here's the weird thing. So these people are gods. It's interesting though because it's like I f I feel like maybe like the big budget version of this would have been a smarter move than Mass Effect Five. Maybe you know. I mean, it's more like, creative and you need more creative for sure. And you're I think you're leaning further into what the modern Bioware fandom is now. Mm -hmm. um, they would prefer something like this, maybe. Yeah, yeah. I think so. Particularly I mean, with a bigger budget. Hell, it. if you, even if you stick to this budget, just. Just use the Bioware characters. Just, right. just make this game, but with right. the Bioware characters all living together for no apparent reason, yeah. with no explanation. This is all Mass Effect <laughs> guys and all the all the Dragon Age people, yeah. and they're all dating each other, and you have to pay for outfits. Like I, I, I guarantee you, like you want to say Bioware, do do that. Yeah, call me. Well, this is a musical, and so it's going to live and die based upon the music. And the music is mixed. Some of the songs are great, and the singing's always great. Like it's pretty funny too to hear like laura bailey sing like she can actually sing like all the voice actors sing pretty well most voice actors can sing yeah i was pretty surprised by that honestly um but some of the songs are awful and they're also some of the pivotal songs where you actually make the decisions on and it's just like nails on a chalkboard getting through some of those songs but there's a lot of music in this so i can forgive the uh the composer for having a couple stinkers in there like this is a big project for somebody to create music because you also have to realize that it's interactive so what will happen a lot of times is when you make your choice mid song, the song changes too. When the next bar comes, suddenly it's played like an octave lower or they'll throw in some minor keys to, to basically show her attitude. So say you make a decision mid song that's negative. The next bar, the song sounds negative. And also now they're ad-libbing the words changing to her for her to express herself to the other character in the game. It's amazing. Again, something I've never seen in a video game before. I mean, that is just dialogue choices, except you've done it to match music up, which is in impressive. But the music changes on your choice. Right. The, the words and the song changes, like, right. but on like, the fly. Yeah, but... So, yeah, you, you, do, you do it three times, basically. Yeah. Um, it's... I mean, obviously, that's where clearly where a lot of the effort and tech and, and money went. Because um, I don't know how much of that they're manipulating digitally, how much of that they actually mm -hmm. recorded. Because blending all that would be very difficult. Yeah. It was all recorded already. Um, but you know, the tech exists for that stuff. It's interesting to see. Um, you know, it, it, you can understand why like he had to strike out on his own to make this. In yeah. the sense that like trying to explain this to an executive that doesn't understand anything about music is going to be torture yeah. basically um yeah you never could have sold this to somebody it would have been very difficult really hard like um, you'd have to have someone who's eccentric and rich basically. and then you'd have to, and then you'd have to just be like you know you pitch this to someone at ea and they'd be like well but the rock band thing's over right and you wouldn't be able to explain to them why this is not yeah the same thing yeah it's like, it, i can see that i it, it's now the, but if this was a big breakout hit which i don't doesn't sound like it is but, yeah um, i could i could see it becoming influential but now, the other thing, too, is that the songs changing on the fly also has some detriments. Like, there are some times where they just don't rhyme. 
Like you choose a lyric and it changes the song drastically and like the lyrics don't rhyme. They're just trying to jam in like all the words that she needs to say before the next bar comes basically. And it can get a little awkward. There's also some audio issues. Some of the voiceover lines are really loud, just like out of nowhere, a couple of the lines. Mm. And this happened on a game like last week that I talked about too, which is weird because it's never happened to me in my entire career before the last two weeks where voice lines were like over modulated and weird. Um, but it happens a couple times in this game as well. Um, but overall, you're going to struggle to find a more innovative game than this. Now, again, I hate musicals, and I will not say that this game is the game that will make people who hate musicals suddenly like musicals. But even as someone who hates musicals, I still enjoyed playing this game. And a lot of it was just because of how refreshing it is. And the story's pretty good. It does drag at points. There was a couple times where I got a little bored with it. Um, I have not finished this. I've played about four hours of it, roughly. I don't know how long it is, but, I mean, the game is, let me double check so I get this right, is 30 bucks. And after four hours of play, I feel like I've probably got that entertainment value out of it. There's a certain element of you're paying a premium for the creative idea that somehow I square away inside my mind. Do you do that? Where you're like, you know... I feel like I need to support this so that we get more new ideas. Sometimes, but I also recognize that individuals don't really matter yeah. in that regard. You know, yeah. I mean, it's like if you... It's also weird to me when, like, someone's like, oh, like, you know, I want to do that to support the... Do that thing. But then, like, if you talk about, like, I don't, I don't want to do this to support, support this thing that backs something I don't like, they think you're crazy. Yeah. It's like, you know, if you can do that, you can also not buy Hogwarts Legacy. Right. You know, yeah. It's basically two sides of the same coin. Yep. Kind um, of the same thing. Yeah. But, I mean, I, I can't see this being like the next big thing, really, but it is an admirable uh, attempt uh, at something interesting. I do think they should have messaged a little better what it is because mm -hmm. I didn't know. What I didn't it know was. either until I started playing. <laughs> like, um, also, like I, Stray Gods makes sense as a title for it, but like. I gotta be honest. When I saw the, the just the art and the Stray Gods title, I'm like, "What is this? Like another MOBA right. thing, or like mm -hmm. a? I thought it was hero like, shooter. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, another hero shooter. I thought it was yeah. just another. Thing. It's 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 weird. Like I don't know how you message that anymore. Yeah, but like especially at this size. It's... And I do regret not finishing this because I didn't get to see the full payoff of all my decisions before I came on Game Face to talk about it. But I just know the next week I'm slammed with other games I got to play. I wasn't going to be able to give any more time to this. And I still wanted to put it on your radar because it is 30 bucks, but it is also on Game Pass. Mm -hmm. And again, I say this almost every week, but this is the type of game that Game Pass is made for. The game that you may not have had the guts to spend the money on on your own, but when it's free and it's just sitting there, why not? And I think you should probably treat this game as a why not and give it a go. Now, I said the game does drag at points and... It drags when it tries to develop characters too much, which I, I don't know if I've ever criticized the game for doing that. Usually they don't develop, 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 sorry, develop characters enough. In this one, it's too much. Like, it's way too wordy. Like, Apollo, dealing with him, trying to get him on your side, is this, like, 30-minute, like, interactive dialogue exchange that you have to go through. It's boring, and him talking about, I've loved her, and blah, 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 forever. And there's I mean, that's, lots. That's Apollo. It is. <laughs> but there's lots of stuff like that in the game where it just drags along. I guess the one way I could put it is interesting things just don't happen often enough. Mm -hmm. The pacing's off, basically. So there are peaks and valleys to it, but the, the idea is completely unique. I guarantee you've never played anything like it. It's called Stray Gods. I think it's subtitled like a musical journey or something like that. And it is on Game Pass right now. So if you're a subscriber there, you can get it for free. And if it's not, it's 30 bucks. That's maybe a little steep. I'd be a little. It'd be an easy purchase at 20 or 25 at 30 So maybe they priced it right mm -hmm. <laughs> when it comes down to it. Uh, but I'm again... Sure it will be that price come, you know, Thanksgiving-ish on Steam or whatever. Yeah, that's possible. Yep. So anyway, there you go. That's Stray Gods. It's hard for me to say who I would recommend it to. I guess people who really like narrative-driven games, yeah, I would I mean, recommend really, it to. Really, this is one of those things you got to just sort of lay the premise out and either you're interested or you're not. Yeah, I think people kind of figure it out on their own whether they're going to mm -hmm. be into it. So you're right. Yep, just laying it out there, letting them know what it is, I think is probably the most important thing. So I did enjoy my time with it. For the most part, there were some downtimes where it, it dragged a little bit. Um, you also have to keep in mind, or I had to keep in mind, that this whole week, it's like anything I played was taking me away from Starfield. And so mm -hmm. I had to be very cognizant of whether that was flavoring 
my impressions of the other games I was playing. Because mm-hmm. obviously in the back of my mind, I want to play Starfield for, over most games. So Same. <laughs> so like while I was playing Madden and playing Stray Gods, anytime I would start to get down on them, I'd be like, am, am I allowing my desire to want to play Starfield to... Because I'm trying to sell to myself that Madden sucks. So I can mm-hmm. go back and play Starfield. Or I'm trying to say Stray God sucks. I can go back and play Starfield. You have to think about all that stuff. While you're, and I don't think that it really influenced my impression of either of these games. So um, there you go. That's Stray Gods. Available for everything, by the way. Um, even Switch. And uh, 30 bucks or free on Game Pass. And with that, it's time to talk about one of our other sponsors. SoundWizardry.com. Fellow sifter, fellow gamer, sound audio engineer, maestro. I said before, he's worked on some stuff for us when we had Borked Audio from Game Face. He fixed it and made it sound amazing. If you need any audio work, check him out. Here's their ad. Experience the realm of extraordinary audio with Sound Wizardry. With a decade-long journey in sound design, we animate your movies and video games with the breath of sound. Our wide-ranging services include sound design, foley, sound mixing and mastering, audio implementation, dialogue mastering, and the crafting of unique sound effects from freshly recorded material. Our portfolio contains Baldur's Gate 3, Steven Universe, Alan Wake 2, Gwent, Cyberpunk 2077, and more. Visit soundwizardry.com and let us transmute your vision into an auditory marvel. Once again, a huge thanks to soundwizardry.com for sponsoring Game Face. In fact, I believe Sound Wizard is in our chat right now, and you guys can all personally thank him for sponsoring Game Face. It makes a huge difference for us, and we really appreciate it. And again, for all your auditory needs, head to soundwizardry.com. And with that, it's time for... That's right. After a week hiatus, Name That Game is back. And I think we have a good one. It's a, I'm just going to, I'll give a little bit of a hint. It's a game that everybody should get really <coughs> easily. And so I tried to make it exceedingly difficult. Hmm. I don't know if that'll help at all or not, but I'll give you that little bit of a hint. A couple things before we get going. If you've won this year, do not play. Also, by the way, for people who are watching who aren't familiar with Name That Game, I show you a bunch of screenshots and you try to guess the name of the game. So if you already won this year, don't play. If you have no interest in PC games, please don't play because the winner of this gets a free PC game. But if you're not going to use the code, please don't play. Let somebody else use it who's actually going to play the game or we'll give it to somebody who will play the game. Um, And then finally, the chat is on slow mode, which means you can only input one chat every 60 seconds. So do not spam the chat with a bunch of random game titles because you're going to (laughs) lose. And with that, I think we're ready. Are you ready, Matt? Sure. All right, don't forget my hint that I gave you before we started today. And here we go with the first screenshot for Name That Game and Go. Ninja Golf, no. (laughs) Spider-Man, no. Yakuza Like a Dragon, no. Heavy Rain, no. GTA 5, no. Flight Sim, no. Ghostwire Tokyo, no. Madden 97. (laughs) Nope. Okay, maybe that's all the guesses on that first one. As always, it's usually just a texture. Assassin's Creed Black Flag. Nope. But that's a pretty good guess. I can see where where you would guess that. All right, here we go with the second screenshot. Oh, wait, people are still guessing. Metal Gear 5, no. Cyberpunk 2077, no. Forza Horizon, no. Oh, we do have a winner. GTA 4, dang. How did you get that? That's pretty insane. Are you the person who also guessed GTA 5 before? I'm gonna scroll up. Nope, that was Call of Duty. How did people know this was GTA from that? I don't know. I'm I mean, curious. If you play GTA 4 enough, I imagine you know what that water looks like if you think about it. It's not water though, that's the thing. That's what is a, it? That's a street. Oh yeah? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Is it raining? No, it's not. It's, it's just, just a glossy. It's just a glossy street? Yeah. That's weird. Uh-huh. 
How did you, I want to know how you got that, Caver. Congratulations again, by the way. That's amazing that you got that. I mean, that's nuts. Maybe you can fill us in, Caver, on what it was that tipped you off. I mean, that's insane, dude. Just to guess a game with cars. Gohan Rage says, I thought it was a lake. Yeah, I mean, a lot of both people thought it was water. Like, for him to th call GTA 4, that's nuts. <laughs> Erebus Jones says, to be fair, the screenshot is about as boring as GTA 4 is. <laughs> Maybe it was just a guess. He won't reply. He did reply. Oh, he did reply. I guess the game with cars. There's no car, though. There's a tire in the corner up at the top. What? Where? I don't know. I can't see, I no can't see that far. There's no people, tire. People are saying there's a tire there. There is no tire in this. This is literally just a texture. I don't know. He just guessed it, I think. Interesting. Tire. People keep saying the tires. There aren't, but we're looking at the image right now. There's no tires in there. The tire, the very top mid. The very top, there's a tire, no? Right below the A. It doesn't look like one to me, but I mean, maybe? I can't see it that far. <laughs> the, 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 the TV for this room. They're saying the that they see it. It's on the other side of the room. So. Yeah. We have, we're, our TV is far away. We can't see it as clear. Interesting. Okay. That's nuts. So, <laughs> just so there's a tire and that was good yeah. enough. <laughs> what's, what's the first game you think of with cars in it? That, GTA I, 4. Maybe some people. Um, here's the rest. Here's the second one. Here's the third one. That's where I thought people may be like, oh, I get it now. Here's the fourth one. That's your driveway right out of your house, right outside your house. I figured people get that easily. And then that one would give it away totally. Mm -hmm. Shows New York. So well, amazing, man. Liberty I mean, city. really, it's amazing. And then Tom Zimmy is like, that's not a tire. That's a sailboat. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think he just got lucky, honestly. Schooner. Yeah. Schooner is a sailboat. <laughs> I, I think Caver just got lucky, but that's okay. I mean, that's, that's why we play. Sometimes you just get lucky. That's life. Um, so, Caver, congratulations once again. Uh, send me a DM here on Twitch, um, or you can send me a DM on Twitter or X, whatever the hell it's called now. I'm at Dinfire there. You can send Sifted a DM on X or Twitter, at Sifted Games, or, if and I have seen you on the site a lot, you can just send me a DM on Sifted where I am at Shane, and we'll get you your code out. And congratulations once again. That, that was one of the most amazing name that games I've seen, hmm. as far as like somebody getting it on such minimal like information. That was good stuff, man. Good job. All right. And with that, we do have some time for Q&A. We always end up kind of squeezing it in in most episodes, but we have a little bit more time today. So if you have some questions you want to ask Matt and I, feel free. Uh, keep in mind that I cannot answer any questions about Starfield at all. Nothing. Unless you've seen something in a trailer or whatever. But even then, I'm not going to answer it because I don't know if it's in the trailer. And you may be goading me into giving you information that I'm not supposed to give you. So I have to be very, very careful with anything about Starfield. So I'm just going to stay out of it. Um, here's one from Vincent. How much of Madden stagnation do you think is the A team working on NCAA right now? And what's your hype level for NCAA? That's a good question. Um, I... I would struggle to believe that the A-team is working on NCAA. I get it. It's been gone for a long time. There's a lot of hype around it. But NCAA never sold as well as Madden, which is surprising, actually, because a college football game should conceivably sell better than a, an NFL game. They just mm. should, because there's more schools. People have gone to those schools. People live around those schools. It's They're a fans. religion. Yeah. I mean, typically you people would think— People murder each other over it. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, um, so you would think college football would sell better, but Madden has always outsold it. So I would struggle to believe the A-team is working on NCAA football. Now, to your question about whether I'm excited for it or not, I guess, like, <laughs> I went to Temple, and Temple's football program, like, at least when the NCAA games were around, was always abysmal. And so when I would play NCAA, my goal was always to take Temple to like a bowl game because they would be like 1-11 and 11 or whatever in the real world. And I'd be like, if I could take this rust bucket of crap talent to a bowl game, that's a pretty big deal. But now that's gone because Temple is actually kind of competitive in college football now. Um, so I can't say that I would be all that excited for it, honestly. I think there's a little bit of an added spark now that it has like real players or it's going to have real players. Uh, because then it'll be interesting to see how 
NCAA football feeds that talent pool into the NFL and Madden? Like, will you be able to start like a, a recruit in NCAA football, raise him up, make him a blue chipper, and then get him on the Steelers and have him be the quarterback of the future for the Steelers? That's compelling to me. So we'll see how the integration between the two franchises works. I think that's where they could really make some hay. Uh, let's see if we got some other ones here. Um, Erebus Jones, on a scale of 1 to 10, how much would you rather be playing on your Xbox rather than podcasting right now? <laughs> No comment. Uh, Zero, because I don't have a reason to play on my <laughs> Xbox. Also, I'm going to try to play that on the PC. Yeah. We'll are see, we'll are you going to? I'll try. We'll see what the performance looks like. I mean, well, it's obviously locked at 30 on consoles. Right. But I, that might be better than, you know, if it's a Jedi Survivor situation. That's true. Uh, it would be better to wait until they've done something with it. Yeah. Um, and the rule currently this year seems to be the PC, PC ports or PC versions are going to launch poorly. Um, I don't think it's just this year. <laughs> no, but this is really pronounced <laughs> yeah, this year. Really to the is. point that even like the you know the the raw power of the forty ninety can't make up for it. Yeah, so. which is crazy. Which is also happening with Immortals of Avium. So that's insane. It's, you're, I mean, dude, your PC should be able to brute force anything into at that least is, sixty frames a second. Performance on that is abysmal across the board. Crazy. Um, like in general, there's a lot, and there's a lot of weird problems and glitches, and the the the. Um, the, the default settings for my, well, that detect your settings and stuff, they're try, it's trying to put the shadows to the low or off oh, on geez. it. And I'm like, put it back up, and it's, it doesn't really change the performance. And it still looks It still bad. sucks. There's a lot of... <laughs> there's no HDR on the PC version. There's, yeah. it's, it's, it's just weird. It's, it's, it's a not a... And nothing really looks that great. Uh, so, like, yeah, I'm, I'm wondering how solid that's going to look. But, again, if you buy... Basically, if you I think if you buy it, through xbox you get both versions mm. and it's cross compatible so it, i can jump back and forth that's good as i please um but i'm kind of expecting to start with xbox i'll start with pc and see what it looks like and if i get fed up with it i'll move over to xbox my bet is you end up on xbox mm -hmm. um from that e seems, that's what happened with jedi survivor i'm gonna guess that's what happens here yep um eth demon what do you think of Baldur's gate 3 success even three weeks out it's still averaging over 500k concurrence with peaks daily over 600k it's amazing. It, I hope that's great. That's what it's that's what's supposed to happen. Like you make a great game, you should get a lot of sales. I, it doesn't always happen that way, but it should happen that way every time. And with Baldur's Gate three, it has happened. So I think it's amazing. And just wait until the PlayStation five version launches. It's going to get a whole other rush of it's a relevance. Little, it's a little bizarre to me. Just really, in the sense that like, I mean, it's obviously big hype, but like the the response to it is bizarre to me. Where like, I mean, IGN gave it up perfect 10 it's got a lot of perfect 10s it's which is madness yeah. to me uh, like, it's, it's not just, perfect nope i mean i've never given a perfect 10 in my entire career i mean i don't agree with the idea that a perfect 10 can never is a perfect i don't agree uh, with that I either i but like and that's not why i haven't never but given this a 10. ain't it yeah um there's plenty of things to improve and and criticize about this one and, and it's fascinating to me that slowly the idea of like there's people that are not enjoying it as much because it is a rules lawyer game mm. is bubbling up, but it's being used by asshole rules lawyer D and D players <laughs> to show that the people that don't like that aren't don't really like D and D because modern they think modern D and D is too soft. All oh, right, is yeah, that, you know these are the people that come it's out. It's actually of, enjoyable, right? These are the people that come out of the war gamer tradition and think right. everything should be measured with you know like rulers and, and all this shit, <laughs> and like no, they think it should be a war game. It shouldn't yeah. be measured with rulers and are you four inches or five inches away from this and then you can't use your spell right, or whatever. right. it's just like it's like it just makes it incredibly boring and tedious it does yeah and um gary gygax the founder of DD, &D, the creator of DD, &D, said dms only roll dice to hear the sound they make mm. he he had he, he, from the top from the very top yeah. like the dm should be making it fun the rules are there as guidelines don't think that that's the fun part of it and unfortunately Baldur's Gate 3 does think that's the yeah, yeah. part of it, and that's part of the problem. The other thing that I've noticed, uh, because I have played it, again, once since last week, and I just do not have the desire to. And part of it, this is weird, but I realize one of the things I really enjoy about RPGs and the style of kind of like the, you know, the interactive dialogue choice, um, you know, like Bioware style sort of thing, this kind of thing. I really like finding out about the world and the characters and what's happening and what's over here and what's doing this and why did this happen. And in D&D, &D, I already know all that 
because I know a lot of D and D lore, mm-hmm. and it's like everyone's talking about so I got stuff's going on in Baldur's Gate. I'm like, I know what's going on in Baldur's Gate. The, the upper city is a bunch of jerks because you can't get the lower outer, outer city. Like, like I know all that stuff, and like the mind flayers are not a mystery to me because mm-hmm. I've read the lore right. books. Right, you know about them I, already. Yeah. I understand what Gail is talking about about the weave and the ancients. I'm like, I know how that ends up working out probably because I know the rules that apply to. There's no mystery to any of it. It's like I'm waiting for all the characters to catch up to what I know about mm. D&D. Yeah. And I don't think there's another way to tell that story, but I don't find it as intriguing as learning more about the world of Mass Effect or the world of Thetis or... Because it's all new. Because it's all different. It's yeah. still rearranged a certain way. You yeah. know, even even Stray Gods is more interesting to me in the sense of like, well, I'm interested to see what they how they do their own twist on what Greek Greek gods and Greek mythology would be carried forward to today and taking into account modern culture. Like that's an interesting idea to me. But this is just sort of replicating D and D, and I don't think I ever realized before. And maybe I was already there because like the D and D campaigns I've played in the last like ten years have all been original settings based on like well, the main one I played was this woman who created a new city that's essentially near Baldur's Gate, but it's a totally different thing. And so finding out how that all worked was interesting. I think I find the D and D setting kind of boring. Yeah, <laughs> like I, it's I can not... see that if you already know everything that's going to happen, it's like they're just telling yeah, a story. It's that not you like I know read. what's going to happen with the characters, but I don't really care. Yeah, especially because it's so weird to me how horny they all are. <laughs> um, I have yet to have sex in that game, and but now the all same, the, but all like, the speed runs are about like how part quick of it can you have me is sex? Like, it's like I keep shutting. Like we've we've had two conversations. Can you fucking chill? Even the people that don't <laughs> like the, 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 uh, Larry, the Githyanki warrior woman. She's like, I hate you, but we could fuck if you want. If you want, I'm just like, well, everybody fucking chill out. Like what? What the hell? Hilarious. At least the Bioware game is like buy a dinner and take you on a couple quests first. Jesus yeah. Christ. Yep. Um, Emperor Dread asks, what annual release franchises are the ones that handle fatigue the best? Ooh. Oh, there was a time when I would have said up. there was a time I would have said Assassin's Creed, but that was long ago. I'm going to refrain from answering this question. Annual release stuff. OK, the annual release kind of lets me off the hook. <laughs> huh? Eh, I, I'm just going to skip it. Sorry. How does, that doesn't have anything to do with Starfield. Okay. Annual releases? Well, it said the annual release part lets me off the hook a little bit, but... Well, yeah. What games come out every year that do it the best? No, I don't know of any games that come out every year that have fatigue. I can't think of a single one. No, like like series fatigue. Like, I'm oh, tired of the game. Oh! I thought, like, character fatigue no. in the game. No, like series... Like, like oh, I thought, like, you're talking about, fatigue. like, encumbrance and stuff like that. No. Oh, Okay. Ones that handle fatigue the best. I mean, probably Call of Duty. There aren't that many annual franchises left anymore. They're all sports, pretty much. Yeah, I mean, people would not have... Uh, I don't think a lot of people would say Call of Duty, except the sales prove otherwise. Yeah. I um, mean, they do manage to somehow release a somewhat different game every year. That's pretty crazy. Like, I don't know how... I mean, I do know how they do it. They have three studios working on the game, and that's the only way you can make something like that happen. Um, Dre Locks, I think that's how I pronounce it. Any hype on Sea of Stars? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I reached out for a review code for Sea of Stars a couple days ago. I backed it. I kickstarted it. I don't know when I'm going to get that code. We'll cover it here on Game Face, I promise you. When is that? It's soon. It's like the end of the month it comes out. It's Uh, one of the last big... Good good luck. Yeah, I know. (laughs) Getting me to play that when Starfield's here. I asked for... Yeah, I mean, I'm going to try to get um, Switch code, honestly, so I can take it home with me. I can't remember. I think I asked for PlayStation code or PC. I can't remember which one. The survey was literally months ago to decide what you wanted. That's rough. Things may change by then. Um, A lot of Baldur's Gate 3 questions. But we're not going to dwell on that anymore. Um, Zet Saber Juno, would you rather have a new Mass Effect game or an expansion pack to Baldur's Gate 3? Oh, Mass Effect. Easily. Yeah. Like, not even close. Um, yeah, for me, it'd be a new Mass Effect. And I'm keep in mind, I'm not, I didn't hate Andromeda. I actually enjoyed Andromeda. So. Yeah, I don't like Andromeda, but I feel like they've learned some things. Yeah. So, yeah, it would be probably Mass Effect for me, too. Um, but I, obviously, I like Baldur's Gate a lot more than Matt does because I'm not like a crazy D and D guy, and I don't remember the story. And uh, for whatever reason, like I never, mm-hmm. when I played D and D, I never played through that story. Like by the time I jumped in, 
everyone who had already been playing for a long time, my group had. And so we were already doing like the little like modules or whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's not it's not repeating any story from the old game or anything. Okay, it's just the setting is the setting and you are all these things that they don't know about these characters don't know about the setting i already do know about the setting so again gotcha. i'm waiting for them to kind of catch up with me on that although okay. some of these characters like carlac is an established character in the lore like she had a uh a magic gathering card when they did their Baldur's gate crossover earlier mm -hmm. last year so um, um yeah i'd re much rather have a, a good new mass effect obviously that is a different <laughs> request than just yeah. a new mass effect but yep um, from Red Fox 1980, have you guys seen the Twisted Metal TV show? I have not. Nope. People say it's kind of funny, though. I know. It, uh, yeah, I know the impressions were much more positive than that first god awful trailer. Yeah. Because that trailer, that first trailer was one of the worst one trailers of the worst I've, ever I've ever seen. <laughs> I just absolutely, I mean, I was like, man, Anthony Mackie needs a new agent if this yeah. is what this thing turned out to be. But, yep. A uh, Corey film, thank you for subscribing with Twitch Prime. I see you in there now. Um, and I think that's it. I think we answered all your questions. You guys have any more? We got a couple more minutes. We could answer one or two more if you got them. Um, Majora Tom will answer one more, but it's another Baldur's Gate question. I um, don't know if you've answered this already, but do you think of the co what do you think of the controversy surrounding the reception to Baldur's Gate three and the sentiment of its success being more of an anomaly and less of the new industry standard? We talked it last week about how um, so, uh, another developer the other developers were complaining that it was raising the bar too high and like developers at like companies with big that gave them big budgets to make games were saying they couldn't live up to it we thought that was a little ridiculous um but <sighs> it's a singular thing like it, it was a seven-year development cycle it's a established company that already knows how to make that game mm -hmm. it's one of the biggest licenses in the world it's a sequel to the, like two games that are considered two of the best things in their genre and the history of the genre um it had basically an unlimited budget because of that. Um, you can't replicate that. Mm -hmm. There is uh, like I not only would I say don't think Try. that Baldur's Gate three <laughs> is going to be the gold standard for RPGs in the future. Don't expect Larian's next game to live up to that standard because that's a diff. Like the asset. I mean, it might just be Baldur's Gate four. Like mm -hmm. who knows? But like the the the. The freedom and, and asset use and infinite budget you get from hooking up with that IP in a situation where that I, the people behind that IP believe in you, mm -hmm. you know, as opposed to, say, the people who made, you know, uh, D&D Dark Alliance, which is a very different situation. That was actually in-house. That was Wizards of the Coast. Yeah. In-house people, which looks like that that's going to go away now, too. Yeah. Um, like, that is not something you can really replicate. Yeah. So no, I think it would be a, it's a it's a nice gold standard in the sense of like here's here's something to use as sort of a pinnacle as a as a as a thing to look at and emulate, but it is absolutely not something we can expect to be the norm going forward. Agreed. Yep. Okay, that's going to do it for Game Face this week's episode of Game Face. Another reminder that we will be here next week, but we will not be here the week after, the day after Labor Day. Um, we will be taking that week off, and then we'll be back the week after that. We don't know if it's going to be on Tuesday or Wednesday. It'll all depend on how my travel goes getting back to the West Coast from uh, Pennsylvania. Um, but look, look, if you uh, listen to this show on any of the podcast services or you watch it on YouTube, it would be awesome if you could head to patreon.com slash sifted. That's S-I-F-T-D. Um, and you can pledge there whatever you want. You can pledge just a dollar a month just to be like, hey, thanks, guys. Um, or you can pledge $4 a month, and that gets you all our content early. You get Game Face four days early. You get Pactor Factor a week early. You get all other content at least three days early. We'd really appreciate it. Again, even a dollar makes a difference. And even for a dollar, you do get rewards at sifted.net. You get a custom frame. You get to use our private forums. So even for a dollar a month, you're actually getting some value out of it. We'd appreciate it very much. And if you can't afford to do that, you can help us for free with Twitch Prime. If you're watching on YouTube, the instructions for doing that are down below. If you've already linked your accounts, why not head over to twitch.tv slash siftedgames right now and resubscribe it literally takes three seconds three seconds to subscribe with twitch prime that's it and you give us a free two dollars and fifty cents for that month it's awesome um, once again a big thanks to our sponsors ls cream go to creamls.com slash sifted a big fan uh, thanks to soundwizardry.com once again, if you have any auditory needs, head on over there. They'll take care of you. We really appreciate it. So we'll be back next week. I saw someone in chat ask about Immortals of Avium. We'll be tackling that next week for sure. However, just to let you know, the embargo for Starfield is still not up for next week's episode. So you got a, a, a time to wait there still. Um, but anyway, thanks for watching. Thanks to everybody who was on chat. 
You guys were awesome as usual. You guys fact check us in real time and make the show better. We really appreciate it. We really appreciate that you guys showed up after the big Jeff Keeley thing. See? <laughs> Most of you should have been asleep by all rights. <laughs> but still, you could totally be on video game burnout by now if you watch his two hour thing and you came here to watch Game Face. We really appreciate it. You guys are awesome. So everybody have a great week. Everybody start getting hype for Starfield. We'll see you next Tuesday. Game Face is up and out. <laughs> <laughs>